Hello and welcome to Kingdom in Context. I'm Sean. Tonight we're going to be picking up our 42 series. This is uh, the part 18 because we're going down from 21. And this is part 18 called The Labyrinth. And I'm excited about this, this particular one because um, there is so much fun information in here. So it helps us know the scriptures better, helps us learn more about history. And uh, I'm excited to present it to you tonight. Before we get started, I want to say a big thank you to all the mods that are in the live chat. Thank you for helping me with any potential spam that may come into the chat, any spam bots, as well as any potential um, disagreement. Now, I just want to also make it very clear uh, to all the mods, if someone disagrees with it, that's okay. Um, but if they start dropping accusations or slandering or name calling um, me or any of the other people in the live chat, that's when you can mute them or remove them. But otherwise, if they just disagree with us, even if it's sometimes it's a uh, um, insistently or angrily, let's, uh, let's try to let them stay so they can have some exposure. If they can't control themselves, you'll have to make a final call. And I trust you to do that. But ultimately we want to welcome everyone here tonight and we thank you guys for being here. I'm excited to pick back up this, um, uh, this, because th this, this is a fun series, right? It's all about the 42 months leading up to Yeshua. So this is an extenuation of our investigating Babylon series that we did last year. And as I've talked about, this particular series is going deeper. The Investigating Babylon series was 21 parts where we did a broad overview. This, we're going to be going deeper. And tonight, it's not going to be any different. Tonight, it's going to be a very deep dive into the theology of Babylon, of Mystery Babylon specifically, um, and how we see that uh, as an absolute contrast to the simplicity and the truth of our Heavenly Father and His Son, Yeshua of Nazareth. So I'm excited to bring this to you. And... Uh, we shall get started right now. Which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. delight in understanding, but that his heart may discover itself. So as we talked about before, as we show at the beginning of every one of these 42 series broadcasts, we remind ourselves that we're, this is the 42 months uh, in the eschatology of the fulfillment of prophecy leading up to the second coming of the Messiah. And that is given to us a time frame, specific time frame given to us in Revelation 13, 4 and 5, as it talks about the, the um, they worship the dragon who had given authority to the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, who is like the beast and who can wage war against it? The beast was given a mouth to speak arrogant and blasphemous words and authority to act for 42 months. So what kind of authority will he act on? It's from the dragon, right? What are the ways of the dragon. They're the opposite of the ways of our Heavenly Father Yahweh. So tonight we're going to be digging deep into why the people are so deceived into following not just the dragon, but then his cohort who gives authority to the, the blasphemous beast who acts and speaks for 42 months. So I'm excited to bring this to you tonight. We're going to be talking about ancient labyrinths. So we see a picture here in the Golan Heights of an ancient labyrinth. As you can see, it's like a circular maze. This is in the Golan Heights in Israel, famous location. We also have ancient records and archeological findings of Babylonian labyrinths, which I think is very fascinating. These have a, a square depiction. We also see in ancient Greece, uh, this one, I believe, is from the island of Crete, specifically. And we're going to be talking about Crete here in more in depth in a minute. Is a Greek labyrinth. This one's in a circular fashion. And this one's going to come up at the end as well. So I want everyone to, to remember the circular fashion 
labyrinths because we're going to look at different types of labyrinths tonight and not only in ancient history but in the modern day and how they're making a resurgence among spiritual pathways and journeys to the divine but we'll also be looking at um out they're used in pop culture in different ways both circular and a, a square fashion but then we're also going to be looking at scripture and um and i just gotta i gotta say stick with us to the end because what we're going to show you in scripture just blew me away um absolutely just blew me away when I was doing research for this particular one. I just, um, I kind of stumbled onto it by accident just through researching the different types of labyrinths throughout history. So I'm excited to share that with you. Do not miss the ending because it's going to be what I feel is going to really make a ton of sense with, uh, some old Testament ideas as far as the relevance to your faith and, and what revelation talks about mystery Babylon being the enemy of, of God. So stick with us. This is a Greek labyrinth. But in ancient Greece, there is a an old story that they would call a myth or a legend, but it's based off of the labyrinth of the Minotaur of Crete. So the idea was that there was a, a massive labyrinth built underneath the king's palace in the, on the island of Crete. So Prince Theseus was a son of King Aegeus of Athens, and not too long before the Trojan War. At this time, the Minoans, who lived in the island of Crete, had a very strong navy. The Minoan king, Minos, would send his navy to attack the Greek cities like Athens. In order to stop the attacks, King Aegeus of, the, of Athens, he made an agreement with King Minos. And if Athens would send seven Athenian boys and girls to Crete every nine years to be eaten by the Minotaur, then Minos would leave Athens alone. The Minotaur was a terrible monster that was half human and half bull. He lived in a labyrinth below the palace of Knossos. Athens agreed but the people were very sad to send their children to certain death. And this is a circular depiction still today from ancient Greece or ancient Crete on the island of Crete of the house of Theseus, because this is the where the, the legend, the mythos came from about how Theseus went down because he loved this girl and she was one of the one of the younger maidens chosen to be sent to be eaten by the Minotaur to appease to appease the demon god Minotaur, um, Theseus decided to go with her and voluntarily go into the maze in order to defend her and try to defeat the Minotaur. And the story is that he finally, he finally did after he wound his, th his way through the labyrinth and finally found the Minotaur and defeated it. And he had a he had a ball of string with him that he took with him so he could he let it out as he went through the, the labyrinth and so he could find his way back out. Because the whole point of it is it is a maze, and we're going to go over some of the philosophical understandings of why. This they spent time creating these elaborate structures and all the symbolism involved and and all the the relevance to um, the gods they worshipped and and the nephilim the demons and everything involved. So there's a lot to it. So let's look at a famous Egyptian labyrinth. Paradoxically, while the evangelical Christian community talks about spiritual warfare, putting on the full armor of God, many of the, oh I'm sorry guys, <laughs> I'm sorry this is actually. Uh, a little bit of a mistake. One second. Oh, I apologize. We'll just go to this one. Okay. So this is a depiction of the ancient labyrinth of Egypt. Now, supposedly, this is an artist depiction, obviously, but we're going to go over the actual archaeological findings where they conclusively have decided they have actually found this. And so... This was uh, this was not in the Cairo area, but is in a different location. We'll talk about that in a minute. But the idea was it was a massive labyrinth that could that could had all the Egyptian temples of the Egyptian gods inside this massive labyrinth. It was multiple layers, multiple levels, if you will, and that um, it was haunted essentially uh, by by the the gods or the unclean spirits from the Egyptian gods. So there was a lot here. This is a, um, it, it's actually, this is an artist depiction of this temple that used to be there as an actual, not temple, but the actual pyramid, the step pyramid that used to be there at this Egyptian site. Even though it doesn't look like that today, we're going to talk about what it looks like today. This is an ancient depiction from the days of Herodotus and his description um, of how the Greeks had settled on top of the roof of this particular labyrinth of ancient Egypt. And that's why you can see the little structures on top from this side view. But down below was supposedly this immense labyrinth 
that was greater a greater architectural feat than all the pyramids combined is what the Egyptologists claim about this particular labyrinth. And we're going to go over some uh, historical quotes that talk about it as well. But they also said that the, the top, the roof of the labyrinth was one solid piece of stone and that it was absolutely massive. So Herodotus, an ancient historian, 5th century BCE, he claims, furthermore, they resolved to leave a memorial of themselves in common, and in pursuance of this resolve, they made a labyrinth. A little above Lake Morris, and situated near what is called the City of the Crocodiles, I saw it myself, and it is indeed a wonder past words. For if one were to collect together all the buildings of the Greeks and their most striking works of architecture, they would all clearly be shown to have cost less labor and money than this labyrinth. Yet the temple at Ephesus and that in Samos are surely remarkable. The pyramids, too, were a great greater than words can tell, and each of them is the equivalent of many of the great works of the Greeks, but the labyrinth surpasses the pyramids also. It has twelve roofed courts, with doors facing one another, six to the north and six to the south, in a continuous line. There are double sets of chambers in it, some underground and some above, and their number is three thousand. There are fifteen hundred of each. We ourselves saw the above-ground chambers, for we went through them so we could talk, talk of them, but the underground chambers we can speak of only from hearsay, for the officials of the Egyptians entirely refused to show us these, saying that they were in them the coffins of the kings who had built the labyrinth at the beginning, and also those of the holy crocodiles. So we speak from hearsay of these underground places, but what we saw above ground was certainly greater than all human works. The passages through the rooms and the winding goings in and the outer, outer through the courts and their extreme complication caused us countless marvelings as we went through, from the court into the rooms, and from the rooms into the pillared corridors, and then from these corridors into other rooms again, and from the rooms into other courts afterwards. The roof of the whole is stone, as the walls are, and the walls are full of engraved figures, and each court is set round with pillars of white stone, very exactly fitted. At the corner where the labyrinth ends, there is a pyramid. Excuse me, there is nearby a pyramid of 240 feet high and engraved with great animals. The road to this is made underground. Such was the labyrinth, but an even greater marvel is what is called Lake Moriz, beside which the labyrinth was built. The circuit of this lake is a distance of 420 miles, which is equal to the whole seaboard of Egypt. So guys, in case you're noticing some of the vast numbers claimed by this uh, account from Herodotus, um, massive, massive structure, um, just uh, unlike any, anything anyone's ever seen today, even pyramids inside this structure that are 240 feet high, that's, if my math is right, that'd be the equivalent of a 24-story building. So inside this structure, there's a lot of um, symbolism and uh, how do I, what's the word? Um, there's a lot of homages to this concept in modern modern media. Um, one of them is from a, a, a movie that came out like 2007 or eight or whatnot. It's called uh, Alien versus Predator, and they go to Antarctica and they find a you know in inside the ice they find this massive pyramid, and uh, and inside the massive pyramid is a labyrinth that starts moving around as they try to get out and everything. And supposedly the aliens built it. So um, obviously that's a modern pop culture homage to this ancient idea. But we're going to actually talk, look at a whole bunch of other pop culture references to this as well. And they all have the same concept. Um, we're going to be talking about the great kings that Herodotus men mentioned that that constructed the labyrinth, according to historians. And uh, it's just fascinating that he's talking about it was next to this big lake as well. I didn't qu include all the quotes from Herodotus, but this lake also had this massive channel system that allowed water in and out. And this is where the holy crocodiles were and the priests who basically interacted with the crocodiles as if they were their pets. And so <laughs> this is why they were saying not only the kings, but the holy crocodiles were buried at the most bottom layer of this massive labyrinth that Herodotus's tour didn't allow him to go down and look at. Another historian, Strabo, from the first century BCE, he says, in addition to the things mentioned, this district has the labyrinth, which is a work comparable to the pyramids, and near it, the tomb of the king who built the labyrinth near the first entrance to the canal, and on proceeding there, at 30 to 40 stadia, that's three to four miles, one comes to a flat trapezium-shaped place, which has a village, and also a great place composed of many places, palaces, 
as many in number as there were districts in earlier times. For this is the number of courts surrounded by colonnades, continuous with one another, all in a single row and along one wall, the structure being as it were a long wall with the courts in front of it, and the roads leading into them are exactly opposite the wall. In front of the entrances are crypts, as it were, which are long and numerous and have winding passages communicating with one another, so that no stranger can find his way either into a court or out of it without a guide. But the marvelous thing is that the roof of each of the chambers consists of a, a single stone, and that the breadths of the crypts are likewise roofed with single slabs of surpassing size, with no intermixture anywhere of timber or of any other material. And on ascending to the roof, which is at no great height, inasmuch as the labyrinth has only one story, one can see a plane of stone consisting of stones of that great size. And there, descending out into the courts again, one can see that they lie in a row and are each supported by 27 monolithic pillars, and their walls also are composed of stones that are no smaller in size. At the end of this building, which occupies more than a stadium, is the tomb, a quadrangular pyramid, which has sides of about four, 440 feet in width and height equal to there, there too. Imandes is the name of the man buried there. And it is said that this number of courts was built because it was the custom for all the districts to assemble there in accordance with their rank, together with their own priests and priestesses, for the sake of sacrifice and of offering gifts to the gods, and of administering justice in matters of greatest importance. And each of the districts was conducted to the court appointed to it, sailing along shore for a distance of 100 stadia, that's approximately 11 and a half miles. One comes to the city Arsinoe, which is in earlier times was called Crocodilonopolis, <laughs> it's hard to say. For the people in this district hold in very great honor the crocodile. And there is a sacred one there, which is kept and fed itself in a lake and is tame to the priests. So this is Strabo's account in the first century. We also have Diodorus in the first century also speaking about the labyrinth. There being no head of the government in Egypt for two years, and the masses betaking themselves to tumults and the killing of one another, the 12 most important leaders formed a solemn league amongst themselves. And after they had met together for counsel in Memphis and had drawn up agreements setting forth their mutual goodwill and loyalty, they proclaimed themselves kings. After they had reigned in accordance with their oaths and promises and had maintained their mutual concord for a period of 15 years, they set about to construct a common tomb for themselves. Their thoughts being that, just as in their lifetime, they had cherished a cordial regard for one another and enjoyed equal honors, so after, also after that, their, after their death, their bodies would also rest in one place and the memorial which they had erected would hold in one embrace the glory of those buried within. Being full of zeal for this undertaking, they eagerly strove to surpass all preceding rulers in the magnitude of their structure. For selecting a site at the entrance of Lake Morris in Libya, they constructed their tomb of the finest stone, and they made it in form of square, but in magnitude a stade in length of 607 feet on each side. And in the carvings, and indeed in all the workmanship, they left nothing wherein succeeding rulers could excel them. For as a man passed through the enclosing wall, he found himself in a court surrounded by columns, forty on each side, and the roof of the court consists of a single stone, which was worked into coffers and adorned with excellent paintings. This court also contained memorials of the native district of each king, and of the temples and sacrificial rites therein, artistically portrayed in most beautiful paintings. And in general, the kings are said to have made the plan of their, the plan of their tomb on such an expensive and enormous scale that, had they not died before the execution of their purpose, they would have left no possibility for others to surpass them, so far as the construction of monuments is concerned. This is a massive structure, is what they're describing, God. There, so we also have a gentleman named Pliny in the first century BCE, another uh, historian. He, he uh, recounts a depiction of the, of the labyrinth as well, and he says, There's a feature of the Egyptian labyrinth which I, for my part, find interest, surprising, namely an entrance in columns made of Parian marble, which is white limestone. The rest of the structure is of Aswan granite, the great blocks of which have been laid in such a way that even the lapse of the centuries cannot destroy them. Their preservation has been aided by the people of Heracleopolis, Hera, Hera, Heracleopolis, who have shown remarkable respect for an achievement that they detest. The, grand, the ground plan and the individual parts of this building cannot be fully described because it's divided among the regions or administrative districts known as districts known as gnomes, of which there are 21, each having a vast hall allotted to it by name. Besides these halls, 
it contains temples of all the Egyptian gods, and furthermore, Nemesis, possibly the Greek equivalent of Nemeter, or Amenhotep III, placed within the 40 shrines several pyramids, each with a height of 40 cubics and an area at the base of four acres. It is when he is already exhausted with walking that the visitor reaches the bewildering maze of passages. And then here on the right, I have a ancient depiction of what they they believed the Egyptian uh, labyrinth looked like with all these temples put together in this single place with these massive columns separating them in a, in a labyrinth fashion, as well as pyramids, as well as a maze at the center of it, which is amazing. Goes on to say, moreover, there are rooms in lofty upper stories reached by inclines and porches from which flights of 90 stairs lead down to the ground. Inside are columns of imperial porphyry, images of gods, statues of kings, and figures of monsters. Some of the halls, some of the halls are laid out in such a way that when the doors open, there's a terrifying rumble of thunder within. Incidentally, most of the building has to be traversed in darkness. This is a this is something I've heard other archaeologists talk about when they go in deep passages inside like the Great Pyramid and and some of the other pyramid findings that you basically uh, the oxygen content is so thin that their their um, torches do not work. So this kind of lends to the whole, you know, ancient theory of they had some sort of power source beyond just uh, just fire which we've tried to go over some different concepts of that from the ancient world, as far as uh, Vajra's uh, being a potential power source um, and different, different concepts that we've talked about in our Investigating Babylon series. Pliny also said, again, there are massive structures outside the wall of the labyrinth. The Greek term for these are the pateron or a wing. And then there are other halls that have been made by digging galleries underground. The few repairs that have been made there were carried out by one man alone, Karaman, the eunuch, the eunuch of King Nectebus or Nectanebo the second, five hundred years before the time of Alexander the Great. So think about this for a minute. Five hundred years before the time of Alexander the Great, we're talking. Oh man, we're talking the days of Solomon, uh, Jeroboam. I mean, we're this is this is. Like, so if you're wondering, if you're reading the Bible and you're reading, you know, second Kings and second Chronicles, and you're reading about, uh, Solomon's day and all that, the, the civil war that happened after Solomon's death and all those things. And you wonder like, what was the rest of the world doing at this time? Well, they were building massive pyramid like structures underground in massive labyrinths next to an established pyramid that was already built above ground. They were doing massive, massive construction projects to which, um, cause people to come and visit historians to come and visit and actually um, try to, you know, remark on. And I'm pretty sure if I remember right, Pliny, his name is Pliny the elder. And uh, he is um, a historian who actually tried to write a, I think it's called a Chronos, Chronos Gragosphere, Chronosphere, or it's a, basically it's a telling of, it's like a, it's like a history book. Um, there was another guy, another Greek named George Sincellus in the eighth century AD about 800 years after Pliny the Elder, who tried to create another one. But Pliny's trying to create one. He's talking about Egypt at the time. And so he's talking about something that happened 700 years before his time. And he's also giving you a reference to Alexander the Great, that kind of thing, because he conquered Egypt as well at one point. So let's look at the actual Egyptian labyrinth and a moment here where they're actually excavating the Egyptian labyrinth. It's pretty, pretty amazing. Just give me one second and I'll pull this up. For ancient historical mysteries to ever be fully resolved. Great enigmas like the pyramids of Egypt seem to somehow resist the passage of time, unchanging as it flows around them, like boulders in the river of history. Occasionally, our civilization makes some small incremental progress, a new tomb is found, or some object discovered, destined to become yet another piece in a museum. Twelve years ago, in 2008, a momentous discovery was made beneath the sands of Egypt. This discovery wasn't simply some small incremental step, 
but represented rather a huge leap forward, an opportunity for historical exploration and learning the likes of which we have not witnessed in a century or more. The great lost labyrinth of ancient Egypt had been found. This was a gigantic and mythical structure, said by some to have surpassed the achievement of the pyramids, a huge array of thousands of underground halls, temples and chambers, dwarfing all known Egyptian temple sites several times over. Not simply just legend, either, this structure was visited and witnessed firsthand by the great historians of millennia past, yet ultimately was lost to the sands of the desert and its physical presence remained unknown for more than 2,000 years. Unknown, that is, until 12 years ago. Despite this incredible discovery, there has been no global press coverage of it, and very few people are even aware that the mighty labyrinth of legend has indeed been found. The discovery was suppressed, and today the incredible potential of this site is being slowly and irrevocably destroyed, by both inaction on the part of the authorities and by the water table in the area that's rising due to agricultural irrigation and the damming of the River Nile. There are several more mentions of this great labyrinth throughout recorded history, but at this point it's enough to say that we have several verified and trustworthy eyewitness accounts of it to verify that it both existed and must have been utterly awe-inspiring to look upon and explore. It's worth noting that Herodotus clearly states that the labyrinth exceeded the works of the Greeks and the achievements of the pyramids. Both the Great Pyramid at Giza and the Temple of Artemis at Ephesus, which Herodotus mentions specifically in his account, are listed as two of the wonders of the ancient world, yet the majesty of the labyrinth is said to have exceeded them. There are a couple more accounts in more modern times that discuss the site, from the late 17th century right up until the turn of the 19th century, including Napoleon's famous expedition, which also visited Hawara. However, it's not until Flinders Petrie established himself at the site that we first get any real modern evidence for the existence of the Great Labyrinth. It is true that Hawara had been extensively quarried and pillaged by the time Petrie arrived on site in 1888. It's why there's nothing left of the casing stones of the pyramid or of anything else, but given the depth of the labyrinth, much of what had been unearthed in the sands near the pyramid were the remains of the Greek Roman structures that had been built on the surface above it. There is also a huge cemetery or necropolis established next to the pyramid, as was the habit of the later Egyptian and Ptolemaic periods, with tombs being dug on top of the labyrinth structure. This cemetery also extended to the area north of the pyramid. Petrie spent two seasons at Hawara, in 1888-89 and then again in 1910-1911. Although he was primarily interested in the pyramid there, he spent the majority of his time excavating in the area of the labyrinth. He did successfully find and map the internal chambers of the pyramid, chambers that are not accessible today due to the much higher level of the water table. I'll take a brief look at this pyramid and Petrie's work here as a follow-on video to this one. In 1889's Hawara, Biamu and Asano, Petrie wrote the following about his investigation into the labyrinth. Quote, this site, named from the village of Hawara nearby, was the principal ground for my excavations during 1888. I do not propose to state here any of the work which I did at the pyramid, as that is still incomplete, the chamber being found, but not yet entered. The most ancient subject for our attention, then, is the site of the labyrinth. By all authors, it is described as being close to a pyramid, and the only pyramid anywhere between the mouth of the canal and Arsino is that of Hawara. How far, then, will the remains at Hawara agree with the descriptions of the magnitude and importance of the labyrinth? We read of the enormous extent of the buildings, and of their exceeding in vastness all the temples of the Greeks put together, and that they even surpassed the pyramids. Of the beauty and magnificence of the work we cannot now judge, as almost every stone has long since been broken up and removed, but the extent of the area we can measure, as marked out by the immense bed of chips of fine white limestone, which lies on the south of the pyramid. 
Wherever we dig down, we find a bed of flat laid sand, or of beaten made of chips of stone rammed down, on which to lay the pavement and walls of some enormous building. And over that lie thousands of tons of fragments of the destroyed walls. On tracing these signs to their limits, it is found that they cover an area about 1,000 feet long and 800 feet broad. These mere figures will not signify readily to the mind the vast extent of construction, but when we compare it with the greatest of other Egyptian temples, it may be somewhat realized. On that space could be erected the great hall of Karnak, and all the successive temples adjoining it, and the great court and pylons of it, also the temple of Mut, and that of Khonsu, and that of Amenhotep III at Karnak, also the two great temples of Luxor, and still there would be room for the whole of the Ramesseum. In short, all of the temples on the east of Thebes, and one of the largest on the west bank, might be placed together in the one area of the ruins at Hawara. Here we certainly have a site worthy of the renown which the labyrinth acquired. This then was the situation of the great labyrinth of ancient Egypt. It was thought to be lost to the sands of time and to the efficient quarrying of millennia, at least right up until the Mataha expedition of 2008. Mataha translates to labyrinth in Arabic, and this was a collaboration between the NRIAG, which is the National Research Institute of Astronomy and Geophysics of Egypt, along with the Ghent University of Belgium, and Louis de Cordier, an artist and entrepreneur who, through his COSCO Foundation, funded the expedition. They worked in partnership with and with the permission of the Egyptian Supreme Council of Antiquities, at the time headed by Dr. Zahi Hawass. Using a combination of techniques, including ground penetrating radar, electrical resistivity tomography, and very low frequency electromagnetic mapping, they extensively surveyed two areas to the south of the pyramid on either side of the Barwabi Canal. The results of this scan are quite astonishing. In the first four meters of sand, there are the remains of the Ptolemaic and Roman era structures. And at five meters, just below where is the current water table, we find the slabs that Petrie mentions, although he believed these were the remnants of the foundations of the labyrinth. It's only once we get to the deeper levels, six to nine meters below the surface, that the other structures appear. You'll also notice the level of the current water table on this graph. It hasn't always been this high. It's only in the last 50 years or so that it's risen to this point. We can demonstrate this by returning to the pyramid here, which does have a megalithic descending passageway underneath the primitive mud brick structure that's on the surface. Flinders Petrie found this passageway and penetrated the chamber that this connects to, but today, only a short distance down this passage, we're stopped by the level of the water table. This isn't due to the canal, which was also there in Petrie's time, but rather due to an effect of the damming of the Nile River by the Aswan Dam. This dam removed the nine-month-long dry season that happens each year, and along with the increase of agricultural irrigation in the area, has contributed to the much higher level of salt water, which is now found only some four to five meters beneath the surface. You can see the effect this salty water is already having on the stone of this passageway, and that's the reason that action is really needed on this site. If we as a civilization wish to preserve and learn from the remains of such a mythical and epic structure as a labyrinth, we need to act as it's currently being eroded and destroyed by the water table. A mapping of the results of the very low frequency testing at around 8 meters depths shows what can only be interpreted as structures, with the different colors representing different materials and also possibly voids. Around so you guys see this? This is the, the thing that, that showed the guy in 2008 on the Mataha expedition. He looked like he was riding on a chariot or like an outfitted Segway that in front of it was um, the ground penetrating radar being pulled by the other gentleman. And this is what they mapped was about eight to nine meters down below the slab that the 19th century um, archaeologist Peter or Peter, um, the one that he said there's a solid slab here on which this Greek settlement was built. And it's this white fine chipped area that we see all these previous Greek houses that were built onto. A lot of people, like I've mentioned in many of my videos, a lot of people don't realize that um, ancient Greece, they ruled over Egypt for a thousand years. So 
they had access to the pyramids and they built megalithic structures just like them. Uh, because uh, once again, it's all a part of mystery Babylon. It's all a part of the overall empire of Babylon as it was being uh, administrated in different ways uh, throughout different countries. So as you can see here, this ground penetrating radar in 2008, it actually shows very explicit nature, eight to nine feet meters down of a labyrinth. It's not a, um, it's, it's not, this is not how dirt looks <laughs> when you, when you do ground penetrating radar, these are, these are intentional, complicated and convoluted maze like structures that's down there, but it would make perfect sense because if you actually put them all together, they're, they make a huge grid like pattern as described from the historians like Herodotus and Strabo and Diodorus, the ones that we read from earlier. So they have officially claimed, and we're going to listen to the last few minutes of this clip, but they have officially claimed that it is there, it is real, but they're not doing anything about it. They're not doing press news releases on it. They don't want people to explore it and excavate it. They don't want to pump the water out that came in through the groundwater. They just want to go on about doing other things. And we're going to talk about um, why they, well, for one, I would suggest several reasons, just like in other, they don't give you in-depth tours in other parts of certain historical pyramids and temples in Egypt. Um, they keep some locked away. Just like when I went to the pyramids, uh, the Mayan pyramids down in Belize uh, several years ago, and they told me how the archaeologists had come in in the 60s and took this uh, mortar and basic rock and, and bricked over all the white limestone pyramids on top of this mountain that we were on top of. Because they didn't want it to be desecrated by the wind and the weather, but yet, but yet it stood for approximately 1,500 years just fine. And so they covered over all the hieroglyphs and everything it talks about. And I would strongly believe they don't want people down here researching something that could potentially be 10 times the size as far as a massive base, 10 times the size of one of the pyramids um, that's filled with Egyptian writings and history and details of kings. And because if you guys aren't aware, um, there's some, there's a, a, an, uh, like a documentary that, that my wife introduced me to a few years ago. It's called Patterns of Exodus. Patterns. Yeah, I think it's called Patterns of the Exodus. Um, maybe my wife can put it in the live chat if she's listening. But, oh no, Patterns of Evidence. Patterns of Evidence. So, um, but it, it, it attacks the established historical timeline of ancient Egypt and validates the biblical timeline. Because what it reveals in that Patterns of, Ex of Evidence documentary is that the historical Egyptian timeline, the one that mainstream academia uh, uses to date things, is, is off, and it is what all other history is based off of. So if they got that wrong, and then you adjust the timeline, and it matches with all the biblical accounts, well, then suddenly all history proves and validates the, the Israelite Hebrew history, okay? So I would imagine there's lots of different places around these temples and archaeological findings, like the labyrinth was purported to have every column within this massive 60, 6, 600 feet squared, massive two-layer slab, every column and the roof was decked out in, art, in, in words and pictures of the ancient Egyptians, the pictographs. I doubt that they want people knowing what's down there, what's what's there, and of course, all the different temples to their gods, because they they thrive on the mystery. It's what's called mystery Babylon. The enemy thrives on mystery, and we're actually going to talk about the labyrinth, as in that was a part of, um, that was a part of the philosophy of the labyrinths and why they would build them. And as we're looking at the Egyptian one, we already talked about there's other ones that've been reported in different parts of the world, including the famous one in, on Crete Island that the Greeks interacted with. So just keep just keep this in mind. We're building, guys. We're building a foundation for this idea and why they were why they were uh, so important for their religion and their philosophy, how it translates to today, how it's infected the modern Christian church and belief sets today, both in in historical times in the early church fathers, as well as the medieval period, and even, even in the modern, modern period, uh, we're going to go into all of it. So stay with us. Changed in a grid like pattern. These walls are said to have the characteristics of granite, which matches the historical accounts of the labyrinth. 
Surely then, such a discovery as this, the finding of a lost and mighty achievement of the ancient world, should have echoed around the globe. After all, only one of the seven wonders of the ancient world is still standing, the Great Pyramid. So strong evidence of something that is comparable to that achievement, if not exceeding it, something that has been lost to humanity for thousands of years, surely this is worth the world's attention. This discovery was only met with resounding silence. Although the results of the expedition were communicated at a public lecture at Ghent University in 2008, and they were reported in the paywalled journal of the NRIAG, it was never ever made public. Why is this the case? In 2010, two years after this happened, a website was established by the expedition leader, and although it too is now gone from the internet, the information remains available for those that want to search for it, via the COSCO Foundation and also by the Wayback Machine, the Great Internet Archive. Quoting directly from this now extinct website, quote, The conclusion of the Hawara Geophysics Survey is, however, still waiting to be internationally released by Dr. Zahi Hawass, the Secretary General of the Supreme Council of Antiquities in Egypt. Since the release of the scan results at the Ghent University Public Lecture, Dr. Zahi Hawass requested to stop communicating our results, intimidating the Mataha Expedition team members with Egyptian national security sanctions. After two years of patience, we decided on June 2010 to oppose all cunning and deceit by posting the conclusions on the labyrinthofegypt.com website. End quote. While the labyrinthofegypt.com website doesn't actually exist any longer, you can still find the paper about the Mataha expedition at the COSCO Foundation website. Its conclusion, at least in part, reads, quote, The Mataha expedition geophysic research confirms the presence of archaeological features at the labyrinth area south of the Hawara pyramid of Amenemhap III. These features, covering an underground area of several hectares, have the prominent signature of vertical walls on the geophysical results. The vertical walls, with an average thickness of several metres, are connected to shape nearly closed rooms, which are interpreted to be huge in number. Consequently, the geophysics survey initiated with the permission of Dr. Zahi Hawass, the President of the Supreme Council of Antiquities, and conducted by the National Research Institute of Astronomy and Geophysics from Helwan in Cairo, with the support of Ghent University, can now officially verify the occurrence of big parts of the labyrinth as described by the classic authors at the study area. End quote. There it is. Officially, they have found the labyrinth, they documented it, they know it's there, they just don't want to talk about it. It's pretty amazing uh, time we're living in, but there's, there's a lot going into this concept of the labyrinths and why the ancient cultures were fascinated with them, why the elites today are still fascinated with them, why it's being pushed into one world theology today. And we're going to look, before we go into so some other facets of this presentation, I'm going to just show you someone made a, a quick 3D animation of what, you know, the labyrinth could have looked like back in its original day before it's uh, lost to time. So let's look at that real quick. It's it's only about like a minute long, but it's pretty interesting because uh, it just shows you the different like as if you were trying to go inside of it and look around and all the different temples that were in there. But it's it doesn't show too much of it. It's just a again, I don't know who made this animation, but it was they they did their best. Let's put it like that. Let me just find it real quick. I had it right here. Where did it go? My computer's doing funny things recently. Hmm. Okay. Thanks for your patience, guys. One second.
Okay. Somebody, somebody play the Jeopardy music. Hmm. It's like it disappeared from my files. That's odd. I had it queued up and everything. Not even coming up when I search either. That is really weird. Okay, sorry guys. We're I guess we're just gonna move on. Um, wow, it's really weird. I guess we'll just move on. Huh. Okay. Well, hang on. I have an idea. I bet I can find it real quick. Maybe it'll let me. Hope. Oh. Maybe it won't let me. Okay, uh, never mind. I guess the entire computer just shut down. So there you guys, here we're back. Always technical problems, always something. <sighs> always something. It's amazing. It's truly really amazing. Let's see if uh, let's see if this is gonna work. Um, Okay, just give me one second. Let me still working with the technical difficulties here. Here we go. All right, so we don't need to we don't need any sound on this. Just to give you an idea here. Just to show you that an idea of the ancient labyrinth in a little 3D animated walkthrough. And it, this one actually, when you really think about what we've already read and how it's described, it doesn't really show the full potential breadth and width of how big this thing could, could be. Imagine these halls, but like to the point where it hits a vanishing point, you don't, you can't see the end of the hall. So they're massive. Another, I thought something that's interesting here, if you look back, whoever did this 3D animation, look how they describe the three patron gods. You got Osiris, Anubis in the middle, and then you got Ra, and look what's above Ra's head wrapped in a serpent. <laughs> so whoever did this animation, they know they've either seen Investigating Babylon or they know Egyptian history. They know exactly what the Eye of Ra is, which is relevant to what we're talking about tonight. Specifically when it comes to the philosophy and the religious importance of the maze. This just shows you the underground level or what they thought it might look like to get to some of the tombs. In the lower level so that's it that's basically all it was but uh i oh, appreciate the super chat peggy thank you so much the super sticker so let's continue let me see here i can't believe my 
Can't believe the whole thing shut down. I'm, I mean, I'm not even like doing anything with the computer. This is a super, super fast computer. Okay. So in ancient times, there is uh, different different cultures. They all had an obsession with the maze or the labyrinth idea. And we can see that this is an ancient Celtic uh, inscription of labyrinth um, written on rocks. We also have other places around the world where they found the labyrinths and different versions of them inscribed on rocks. This is a very common symbol for the labyrinth and we're, and that's going to come into play later. And that's, there's a reason for it. So just remember that this, this circular fashion, remember there's the square labyrinths and there's the circular labyrinths. So we also have the circular ones also in the Golan Heights in Israel, as we talked about in medieval depictions, you have a knight fighting the Minotaur inside the labyrinth or some hybrid version of the Minotaur. And then you've got a circular labyrinth all around them. So this is a, oh, Sanguine95, thank you for the super sticker. Appreciate that. Much love, thank you. Now, some churches have decided to put labyrinths inside. It became a popular thing to do in the medieval era in uh, Orthodox churches. And then this is, I believe, the church in San Francisco um, that has, I think it's called Grace Cathedral. And uh, I believe this is the one that has the, the, the female uh, the female bishop. And so they decided to put a labyrinth there in their cathedral. Um, you see labyrinths in other parts of the world, just in, randomly inscribed on rocks in different countries as an obsessive concept. But there is a labyrinth phenomenon. Oh, Evan Freshwater, thank you. Just discovered KSC six days ago. Uh, 27 binge for you. <laughs> yeah, it becomes a binge, man. I appreciate it. Thank you for that for that uh, super sticker, or super chat. So here in one of the cathedrals, they talk about, it's a paradoxically, while the evangelical Christian community talks about spiritual warfare and putting on the full armor of God, many of these same churches can be found embracing that which they claim to counter. In seeking relevancy, we've become dangerously experiential in nature and old forms of mysticism are now centerpieces and experiences of faith. This is what we're seeing with churches implementing these labyrinths for these people to go and take the spiritual path journey to walk on. The labyrinth prayer walk, which follows a single winding path to a central location, is a case in point. Primarily jump-started by a UK-based Christian movement in alternative spiritual expressions and by an influential San Francisco cathedral, denominations around the world are embracing labyrinths as a viable part of the spiritual journey. So this is... Um, Another quote about labyrinths in the modern day. Understand Christians looking for ways of bringing in new relevancy within church worship did not rediscover the labyrinth as a spiritual tool. As we shall see, it's been a part of the esoteric world for a very long time, which is why today the labyrinth walks and prayer journeys are being promoted by Rosicrucian groups at New Age festivals and celebrations and throughout the neo-pagan world. Not surprisingly, one of America's largest witch, shaman, and neo-pagan assemblies, the 2005 Pagan Spirit Gathering at Wisteria, Ohio, held a nighttime summer solstice labyrinth ritual, which was described as a transformative walking meditation through an all-night labyrinth formed by 1,000 lighted candles. And this is a picture of that big witch, shaman, neo-pagan celebration with 1,000 candles making a whole bunch of labyrinths. In discussing the labyrinth as a religious tool, the Penguin Dictionary associates the maze or the labyrinth with the Buddhist mandala, and it's an aid in spiritual initiation or initiatory journey. So many of you guys may have recognized this, both on um, coins from uh, Eastern Asian countries, as they'll have a labyrinth centered around the Buddha. Who did we talk about the Buddha being an avatar representation of in previous installments of this and also in our Best Game Babylon series? It was uh, Vishnu, or the Egyptian equivalent would be Anubis. In the same way, in discussing the labyrinth as a religious tool, the Penguin Dictionary associates this as the Buddhist mandala. And this is why you see them create a rock stone circle labyrinth Remember, it's that circular labyrinth pattern. 
And this is why the, the Buddhist monks will sit around it and do meditation. Ancient Pathways Home said, thank you for the super sticker. I appreciate that. That's generous. Thank you. Kabbalistic tradition taken up by the alchemists, mazes filled a magical function, which was one of the secrets attributed to Solomon. Now, keep in mind, guys, Solomon has been just getting drugged. For, I, I, the Bible doesn't tell one way or another at the end of his life where his heart was at. But since throughout all of history, the you know Freemason Society, all the you know the Illuminati societies, the Rosicrucians, the uh, the Opus Dei Society, all those people, they all look back to Solomon like he was some grand, amazing person. And um, and yeah, the Bible has high things to say about Solomon's wisdom and his wealth and how he acquired you know peace treaties and during his day and all that kind of stuff. But there, I've never seen anything in the scriptures that directly attribute what's now being attributed to him back then. So again, they can just like the just like the Catholic Church holds the Bible up, but then teaches you their own traditions in the same way. A lot of these secret society groups could easily hold up the memory of Solomon and say, "Look at this grand, incredible, you know, wise king that that we uh, have as our as someone to look up to," and then teach you all a bunch of other mysticism and traditions. So, but what they claim in the Kabbalah and the Kabbalah Kabbalistic traditions is that the mazes fulfilled a magical function, which one of the secrets attributed to Solomon. This is why the mazes and cathedrals, those series of concentric circles broken at given points on the circumference to provide a strange and tangled pathway, came to be called Solomon's maze. Alchemists saw them as images of the whole task involved in the work, which with its major difficulties, an image of the path they needed to follow to reach the center, arena for the two warring natures. To enter and to emerge from the maze might be the symbol of resurrection and death. So as we go to the philosophical representation, the allegory of it all, why this maze, why are they obsessed with this? It's all about a spiritual journey, a spiritual pathway. The idea is that you, as you walk in towards the center of it, you're releasing, you're emptying your mind, you're letting go. It's like a meditative practice. This is why they relate it to a spiritual path or spiritual journey. And it's a religious practice. Now, I'm not saying that if you bought your children a book that had mazes in it and they tried to find their way out of the maze, I'm not saying that they've engaged in some sort of occultism. Okay. It's a difference between someone that's a kid and is just trying to solve a puzzle and get out of a game versus someone that's doing this with the intentionality of a religious practice to empty their mind. And then as they get to the center and find their way back out, they're supposed to be filled with a connection to the divinity, to the deity of the God within them. So this is a very occultic practice, religious practice. Okay. So let's, you know, we, we don't want to, we don't want to go overboard on, on kids playing little games that you might buy them in a little coloring book or something. So this, this is done with intentionality. This is an actual physical practice that they do. So it goes on to say, um, to reach the center of the maze, like a stage in the process of initiation, is to be made a member of the Invisible Lodge. And this is an, from this particular book cited below. This is an author's note, The High Calling of the Mystery Religions, and which the maze makers always shroud in mystery, or better still, have always been left to be filled by the finder's own intuition. So as a part of the spiritual pathway and journey, they allow you to insert your own sense of importance or your sense of meaning. And that way it becomes a type of opportunity for you within their mysticism for you to connect with the uh, quote unquote divinity within you. And we're going to explain how scripture teaches the opposite of this. The Labyrinth Society, they talk about mazes, talking about the mystical journey to spiritual fulfillment. The middle eye of the labyrinth becomes a place of divine illumination. Even Kimberly Lowell, the president of the Labyrinth Society, a network of labyrinth scholars and enthusiasts, recognizes this basic function. The labyrinth is an archetype of transformation. It transcendent nature knows no boundaries, crossing time and cultures with ease. The labyrinth serves as a bridge from the mundane to the divine. Okay, guys, so we're getting a, a sense of why they care about the labyrinths, why the Egyptians would spend this time. Because remember what the Egyptians believed, even though that one quote from Diodorus said it was these 12 rulers from ancient Egypt that ended up coming together to fund the building of the labyrinth, which was also going to be their tomb. Because what did they believe that they would go and commune with the divine gods upon their death? And so they needed to bring stuff with them in their tombs um, or make their tombs represent those gods they worshipped that they hoped to commune with after their death. Um, as their hearts were weighed according to Ma'at, something we, we referenced a couple uh, 
parts ago in um, part 20. So we're going to go over ma'at a little bit more in a minute because it has to do with the philosophical nature of the importance of how, um, of why these, the, the, the idea of finding yourself within the maze is a big deal to the occult. So it's about a spiritual journey where you look inward and then it does have a religious standard by which you're judged by. And that would be the Anubis would be weighing your heart against the feather against the principles of Ma'at. So this is where we're going to expound more about this and explain a little bit better. Um, Kathy Dorr from a book, Math and History of Labyrinths, she says that moving through a labyrinth changes ordinary ways of perception connecting to the inner and the outer, the right brain and the left brain, the involutional and the evolutional through a series of paths that represent the realms of gods and goddesses. These realms are associated with planetary movement as a process that induces union with the one. I want you guys to play close attention because we're starting to get into the language of their philosophy of why this, this type of inward seeking to union with the one and bringing you to into the realms of gods and goddesses, why this is all going to matter because it's going to get wild here in a minute. Also, if you're noticing these churches and these community centers and other places where they're putting labyrinths, they're always encouraging the kids to go out and do it. We're going to watch a, a TED talk here in a minute where they actually show um, they're actually doing an entire TED talk on labyrinths just to a group of kids. Divine illumination is the end goal of esoteric philosophy. It's the central arena of occultism. Manly P. Hall, one of the 20th century greatest esoteric philosophers and an eminent Masonic historian, tells us that the labyrinth was symbolic of man's search for truth. Other occultic scholars tell us that the labyrinth symbolized to the people the difficulty of finding the path to God. All of this, all of this points to the same thing, the mystical realization of our own divinity. And this is from a Manly P. Hall's book, The Secret Teachings of All Ages. It's also described as Hall states in one of his earlier books, man is a god in the making, and as in the mystic myths of Egypt, on the potter's wheel he is being molded. When his light shines out to lift and preserve all things, he receives the triple crown of godhood. Some of this language starting to sound eerie. Not eerie as in scary, but eerie as in, we've heard this before, haven't we? We've heard some of this language, haven't we? Unity with the one, the triple crown of godhood. <laughs> You're, you're probably going to realize here in about 30 minutes exactly what we're talking about and why you've heard it on my channel so much with the uh, specific guests that I've had on. Rosicrucian authority Christian Bernard explains this mystical goal as the building and unfolding of the inner temple. The temple of the universe, the temple of the earth, and the temple of life are only one in the temple of man. Hmm. Haven't we heard some new covenant theology that you are the temple now yeah they take the metaphor that paul adapts in the scriptures and says oh, don't you know that you're the temple of god don't combine yourself with the prostitutes talking about the deposit of the holy spirit in you and they literally call you a temple and they say that jesus is ministering his priesthood inside your temple somehow it's interesting interesting language this is why the time has come to work towards rebuilding it for the Masonic light must emanate from the heavenly Jerusalem, which vibrates within us. This is from Christian Bernard, 1995's book, So More It So Mote It Be. And this is a um, the Rosicrucian Society, AMORC. Initiation is the process of inner transformation. To that end, esoteric societies and occult orders employ initiation as a vital component to spiritual advancement. Indeed, the initiation is the pathway, the journey to mystical completeness. This is the occult metaphor of the labyrinth, the metaphor that is played out in a host of mystical similes. Consider the following archetypes. Keep in mind, each example is replete with historical and religious connections to the mystery religions of which the labyrinth is but a part. And this is a Rosicrucian diagram on the right-hand side. looks very much like the Tree of Life, Kabbalah, Kabbalistic Tree of Life. And this, uh, this quote, by the way, is, just, is from a, a writing of historic and occult philosophers who assert their links between mysterious religions and today's esoteric societies, including Manly P. Hall, Foster Bailey, Albert Pike, C.W. Ledbetter, is, uh, Israel Regarde, Papis, A.E. Waite, a whole bunch of others, Lob uh, Blavatsky, Helen Blavatsky, and a whole bunch of other um, highly, highly 
renowned occultic names. When the Masonic candidate undergoes his initiation, he is led on an invisible path from station to station throughout the lodge room. Each point and part of this journey is given an esoteric explanation. That is, the real meanings are cloaked in allegory and symbolism. So this is something that we've we've talked about. Like, why are we seeing the representations? Keep that in mind, guys, that the real meanings are cloaked in allegories and symbolisms. We're going to see some of those symbolisms as we've already been showing you with the different representations of things, the Egyptian gods and what they, they represented, like the Eye of Ra being personified as an allegory with Diana or Artemis to the Greeks. So we're going to see that kind of thing come around again as we go back into Egyptian mythology and history and break down their symbolism and their allegories of how they apply certain concepts um, relating to the labyrinths. After completing the journey around the lodge, he is led to the center of the room where he kneels before an altar. The worshipful master asks what the candidate most desires, and the initiate responds with light. Knowing this, the light requested is not incandescent light or some other physical light energy, but spiritual illumination. Manly P. Hall, speaking of the Masonic interfaith ideal of the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, penned these words. The true Mason is not creed bound. He realizes with the divine illumination of his lodge that as a Mason, his religion must be universal. Christ, Buddha, or Muhammad, the name means little for he recognizes only the light and not the bearer. He worships at every shrine, bows before every altar, whether in temple, mosque, or cathedral, realizing with his truer understanding the oneness of all spiritual truth. So we're seeing the reality of a high-level uh, Mason explaining that hey, they don't they don't favor Christianity, they don't favor like they favor the light bearer. They favor the light, the illumination of the wisdom above the representation or the prophet or the person bringing the wisdom so they that way they can have an interfaith and they can bring it all together in a sense a rosicrucian uh, explanation goes that the temple ritual second portal the student partakes in an allegorical journey searching for light and knowledge while engaged in the ritual the student follows a path to each point on the compass and returns to a central triangle Again, like the other two illustrations above, this act is part of the mystical journey towards light and cosmic unity. Speaking on uh, more of the, the practices of the Order of the Eastern Star, which is the, the offshoot of, of Freemasonry, is as a co-Masonic body, the Order of the Eastern Star engages in a series of ritualistic initiations, unlike Freemasonry, the Order of the Eastern Star ritual work is performed on a giant floor rug pentagram. This pentagram with an altar placed in its center is called a labyrinth. Each of the various initiation rites, journey on the path to greater understanding, take place in and around this labyrinth. Bula Malone, past Grand Matron and Secretary of the Order of the Eastern Star, explains, the winding in and out of the labyrinth symbolizes the human soul stumbling and struggling through life learning by mistakes and experiences that the way leading to the supreme life and to God is not easy, but is a way of testing one's power and strength. So not, not relying on the strength of your heavenly father, who's there to, to give the spirit through Christ's priesthood to you, but relying on your own power and strength as you try to find the illumination, stepping into the realm of the gods and goddesses, becoming one with light and the cosmic unity. You see how this is all very new age, very esoteric philosophy, very much a cult, very much opposite of what scripture teaches as far as a spiritual practice or application. It also goes on to say, by following the example symbolized in the lives of the heroines of our order's authors, note this is part of the Order of the Eastern Star Labyrinth journey. We may come into a full light of his star in, into wisdom and understanding. So whose star? The light bearer's star. Who's the light bearer in the Masonic order? It's Lucifer. It's or Jabulon, as they call him, technically, the Egyptian term they were going to give him. It's Ra. The great magnet of our star, as it shines forth in the world, is mission to bring unity to the truth of fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. So you can even see, by the way, in this, in this order of the Eastern star emblem, it's just a Baphomet. It's just an upside down goat head. It's an upside down star, five pointed star. And herein lies the deeper spiritual meaning of the labyrinth walk that has become so fashionable today. 
It's the symbolic journey of illumination, completely spiritual in nature and dependent on our works, the journey or the testing of one's power and strength. The path to the center of the labyrinth is as the invisible but tangible path leading to the esoteric altar. It's an initiation into the mystical. It's an initiation into the mystical. Grace Cathedral. This is from this is from a church in San Francisco, and this is from their website. It's called Grace Cathedral, and they talk about the labyrinth that they put in their church. As you can see, they got people walking around it. The labyrinth is an archetype, a divine imprint found in all religious traditions in the world. By walking a replica of the Charter's Labyrinth, laid in the floor of Charter's Cathedral in France around the 1220s, we are rediscovering a long-forgotten mystical tradition that is insisting to be reborn. And Grace also points out that the labyrinth is a shared esoteric tradition. In Native American culture, it was called the medicine wheel and man in the maze. Now, keep that in mind, guys. Um, not specifically that other cultures like the Native, some of the tribes of the Native Americans uh, had their own version of this, which they did, um, but that they called it the medicine wheel. So that, that word wheel is going to come up here in a little bit later as we explore some, some stuff in the scriptures. So stay, stay with us, guys. In Native American culture, it's called the medicine wheel, a man in the maze. The, the Celts described it as a never-ending circle. It's also called the, in the Kabbalah in mystical Judaism. One feature they all share is that they have one path which winds in a circuitous way to the center. Jeremiah 17, 9 through 10. Yahweh tells us the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, that's Yahweh, searches the heart. I examine the mind to reward a man according to his way by what his deeds deserve. No labyrinth required. And why would you want to look inward to find your own divinity, to connect with the cosmic unity as you look inward to somehow step in the realm of divine gods and goddesses by, by doing this little literally walking in circles. You know, I've made the joke in the past that um, bad theology has got Judaism praying, praying to a, speaking to a wall in Israel today, when the same way to the esoteric philosophies of the occult religions, it's got them literally walking in circles, looking at themselves to try to figure out life instead of looking to the creator, instead of looking to Yahweh. It's the futility of deception. Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Who runs? Who's associated? Who's the main God associated with the labyrinths? Anubis, the God of death. Proverbs 15, 14, a discerning heart seeks knowledge, but the mouth of the fool feeds on folly. The, again, wisdom principles. You want wisdom? Yahweh's giving you wisdom. We got a ton of them. We got, a, we got lots of wisdom. He's ex, he's expressed his wisdom with so so many words and proverbs and teachings and understandings. All scriptures God breathed useful for teaching, training, correcting, training righteousness. It's beautiful. It's wise. It's there for us. We don't need to walk in circles and look inside of ourselves and hope something happens. Revelation twenty two three through five. What about that illumination that the the esoteric religions promises you? What about that light? Right, You're trying to go find the light as you blindfold yourselves and you're led like a blind man from one place to another inside of this uh, initiation ritual in the Masonic Lodge. And then they, and you kneel at an altar and you ask the, 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 whoever the master of the ceremonies is, what do you want? And they ask you, what do you want? You say, Oh, I want light. Well, what does God promise you? He already promises you it's light. Revelation 22, three through five. There'll no longer be any curse. The throne of God and of the lamb will be within the city. His servants will worship him. They will see his face. His name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night in the city, and they will have no need for the light of the lamp or of the sun, for the Lord God will illuminate them. It will shine on them. They will reign forever and ever. Let's look at some labyrinths in modern times, because they're everywhere. So people are going out as a hobby and drawing them on different places and putting them in different earthen works and uh, doing snow snow crop circles out of them. There's real crop circles that we're going to look at later as well. But here's a here's a crop circle at this ancient uh, Celtic ruin with a labyrinth. Again, Grace Cathedral in San Francisco. People love to make labyrinths as hedge mazes in their gardens. 
this is uh, massive, massive hedge gardens, labyrinths. Circular, square, all different types. Those who are wealthy, they love, they know this is this is probably the easiest way to know that someone's a well-connected Masonic uh, part of the Masonic Brotherhood in one of the secret societies or not is they have not only the money to 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 build this and have it maintained, but they intentionally build this. Many times I've talked about this in the past. Several years ago, I I lived in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and um, I worked for a company that I'd have to go out to people's houses and do inspections. And so I went to this guy's house. It was a really nice neighborhood, wealthy man. And I'm, I'm walking around his property and I saw he had a, a rock circular labyrinth and I didn't know what it was. I just knew that I knew that I already see the, uh, the Golan Heights circular rock formation. And I didn't know what that was back then either. And I, I tried to talk to him about it. And as I went inside of his house, I saw he had on his table, the Masonic Bible. And, um, and so I tried to ask him a few questions about him. He didn't like that. And he asked me to leave. So very interesting, very interesting. But you're going to see these as in the modern time, people will even make hedge gardens out of these. Very wealthy places will, they love the labyrinths. This is actually at the Vatican. Of course, the Vatican has labyrinths, right? Of course. There's another Vatican labyrinth hedge garden. That's, uh, I can't remember exactly where this one was. Labyrinths are everywhere in modern times. This is a, I can't remember the exact location. I think this one was in Ireland, but they put a statue in the middle of this one. Here's crop circles. People are taking the time to go out and do crop circles and make labyrinths out of them. Here's another interesting labyrinth in a crop circle. No one knows who made it from 2014. Here's a square labyrinth in a, in a circular crop, which is interesting. But let's actually look at something fascinating and scary all at the same time. You guys remember we talked about how um, in some of those pictures that we saw earlier, some of these, these uh, community centers that are putting labyrinths in and, and public parks are putting labyrinths in and then churches are they're having children and all these things go to walk the labyrinth. It's a spiritual journey. Well, they're also giving full on TED Talks about labyrinths. So let me pull this up real quick. Listen to this and see. I might have to stop it periodically. Hey guys, I am thrilled to be here today. But the first thing I need from you is a promise. The journey that we're about to take together is very strange, probably very unfamiliar, and took me a very long time to understand. I need you to commit to keeping an open mind for the next eight minutes. Promise? Promise. Okay. You guys see this? It's all children in the crowd. I'm not sure if they uh, organized this this particular TED talk uh, intentionally inviting all the children or if they outfitted the stage at some other children's event to, to turn into a spontaneous TED talk. The point is it's all children. When I say labyrinth, you might imagine this or this. <laughs> the labyrinth I want you to picture. Very, very popular children's book, the battle of the labyrinth. So, they're, it's the number one New York Times bestseller. They're hitting them on different angles. It looks something like this. Labyrinths date back as far as 2,000 years ago, but they've morphed into something increasingly relevant in today's culture. Labyrinths are used as a meditative and creative tool. I walk labyrinths because often I have so much going on around me that I need a quiet place to collect my thoughts. I'm also an actress and a writer, and labyrinths can be an outlet. You don't say for me to get words on paper or look at my 360 degree surroundings in a completely different way. Now you may be thinking. So I want you guys to notice, even though this is a young woman, I think she's probably 19 or 20 or whatever, but notice the language that she's used in the script for her speech. It's um, very much language of uh, grooming. That's the language of indoctrination. Open your mind, look at things in a new way, 
start to realize these are these are what's called weasel terms that weasels your uh, defensive brain down and opens up your right brain so that you can be open to suggestion. Good for you, but what do I do? Where do I even begin, and why would I want to? Well, the first thing you have to do is find a labyrinth. And trust me, this is not as hard as it seems. In Dallas, there are public labyrinths in Kessler Park, SMU's own Perkins School of Theology, the Children's Medical Center, and many more. Here's a hint. Google Worldwide Labyrinth Locator, and you can look up a list of all the labyrinths in your city. I bet there's one much closer to you than you would expect. Now, once you get to the labyrinth, do not be intimidated. It may seem like all the twists and turns and dead ends will keep you from ever getting where you want to go. But if you follow the path, there is no way you can get lost. Here are three steps that might make things a little bit easier to visualize. So in case you didn't recognize that, guys, they were showing a labyrinth at a university as well. So all age groups, public parks, worldwide labyrinth locator, um, they're trying to put these everywhere so they get exposure to young people. Step one is release. Take a deep breath and begin your walk to the center. Yes, someone in the live chat heard that right. Perkins Theology School also has it as well. Sure. This is a time for you to calm down, take a, get focused, and center yourself. Let go of everything you've been carrying around with you, whether it be stress or expectations, or in my case, a mix of both. Step two is receive. The center is a sacred space for you to gain something from your walk. It's often abstract, and for me, it changes each time. While I'm in the center, I might need some quiet, or I might need to really think hard about something. There's no set length of time you remain in the center. That's really up. Okay, so people, family in the live chat, let's not focus on the presenter. Let's just think about the message. Um, <laughs> pray, pray for the young lady <laughs> as the presenter, and let's just let's just uh, think about the words that she's actually saying and what the message is these kids are hearing. To you. Step three is return. Your walk back out is a transition from the world of the labyrinth back into your ordinary life. You return armed with your new knowledge and new peace. So remember what we talked about earlier? It says release, receive, and return. You see that? So remember what we talked about earlier about how that was what the um, Manly P. Hall and other people were talking about at the point of the labyrinth is that as you're going into the center of it, you release all your cares, you release your mind, you empty your mind. That's why the Buddhists use it for meditation. You empty your mind, and then once you get to the center, you receive something. It's your connection with the divine, and then you return back to the outer world. So basically, that's why the secret societies use the concept of a labyrinth in a different form, but they use the concept, the, the physical, uh, the, the, the philosophical and the theological uh, concept of the labyrinth uh, for their initiation so that you enter in to their to their occult. The world of the labyrinth back into your ordinary life. You return armed with your new knowledge and new peace. Labyrinths have recently become very personal to me because of an amazing trip I took this summer. I traveled to France with a group called Sacred Sites Quest International Exchange, and we built a labyrinth in the most historic site in all of Lyon. The do, you, do you guys ever see that movie Taken? By the way, I have to stop this because it's a TED Talk video and it'll pull me down for copyright, so be, be patient with me, guys. I have to stop periodically. Um, do you guys ever see that movie Taken with Liam Neeson back in like 2007, 2008? And she just said she went on this group with other people to different countries, the Sacred Sites society or whatever and i'm like that sounds like like a prime setup for a taken movie you know a bunch of late teen early 20s uh young women go to these little sacred sites around the world i'm gonna go over to europe to sacred sites and look at some some uh circular rock rock labyrinths you know i'm like yeah that just sounds like a perfect way to get kidnapped man third largest city in france before arriving in Lyon, we toured France in search of labyrinths all over the world, all over the country. And because Europe is where labyrinths took root centuries ago, and, they, um, and where they grew into this cultural artifact that they are today. This is a finger labyrinth in a tiny, tiny chapel in Janainville, 
which is a village with a total population of 564 people. It's about this big, and it's thought to have been found underneath the chapel during renovation. This is the Amiens labyrinth. It's octagonal, so it's a little different. Um, and this is the outside of this stunning cathedral. And here comes the real heart wrencher. If you ask anyone who knows anything about labyrinths, the first place they'll mention is the Chartres Cathedral. It's like the king of all labyrinths. Um, I don't know if she's had a lot of historical research, but most people mention the ancient labyrinth in Crete with the Minotaur, which is kind of interesting because she actually put the title of her presentation was um, something about not Minotaurs, but something about what, what was the title of her the beginning? She put it at the very beginning. Um, let me look at it real quick. It's right when she walked out on stage. It's in the back. Yeah, finding meaning, not minotaurs. So I'm surprised that she's saying, if you know anything about labyrinths, you know about this cathedral because it's, it's it goes back to ancient times, not to medieval cathedrals. It's octagonal, so it's a little different. Um, and this is the outside of this stunning cathedral. And here comes the real heart wrencher. If you ask anyone who knows anything about labyrinths, the first place they'll mention is the Chartres Cathedral. It's like the king of all labyrinths. However, uh, yeah, Chartres is a it's a bad name for a cathedral. But they would have never known that you know what was going to become of that word. While we were there, the Chartres Cathedral was undergo undergoing a much needed renovation which meant that this renowned labyrinth was completely covered in plywood. We didn't even get to see it. This is where the labyrinth should have been, but as you can see, it's covered up by a forklift. Fortunately, this opened doors for us to walk what I affectionately refer to as the secret garden labyrinth. It was in a private hotel garden just down the street from Chartres, and it's an exact model of Chartres, which means all the dimensions and design is the same. <laughs> Stop saying shards. It was so intimate and unlike anything we had seen and I have seen ever. Um, By the way, it's not spelled S-H-A-R-T. It's spelled C-H-A-R-T-E-S. It's a, it's a French word, I believe. This, could you go back a slide? Is that okay? Thank you. Um, now, in Lyon, there is a big hill overlooking the entire city. It's got a panoramic view. And it's in between a city landmark and a centuries-old cathedral. And we were building in a garden right in the middle of the two. This is a postcard I found from 1917. And right where that arrow is pointing is where our labyrinth is. This is our view. And this is our finished product. It took us a little under three days. First, we had to spray paint the concentric circles onto the grass, and then we had to dig the trenches and lay in the pavers, which are the bricks, so that they were perfectly level with the ground. This is my favorite picture from the trip of my best friend and me in the center, right before we said goodbye to our labyrinth and left for the airport. Now, so <laughs> imagine going to France so you can build a labyrinth, spend three days building a labyrinth instead of like seeing France. <laughs> Poor girl, she got gypped on her, on her trip to France. More importantly, uh, this trip shaped the way I look at the world. I not only fell in love with France, but I discovered history and art and geometry and a strange camaraderie that came with being one of a... Uh, it's too easy. I, I, yeah, hopefully she learned geometry when she was 15, approximately 14, 15 years old in geometry class. Few people who realize the deep importance of this tool. Before I go, I want to put our project into perspective. One week after we left Lyon. So did you guys hear that? She said there's few people that realize the deep importance of this tool, but she hasn't explained the deep importance of it. So again, she's talking to children. She's given a very short talk. It's like five minutes total. And she, she's not going to explain the deeper. All, think about all the things we just read and discussed from the occultists who describe the deep importance of labyrinths. She's not doing that. She's introducing. This is a these seven and eight-year-old, 10-year-olds sitting in the crowd. 
they're going to hear it more and more. They're going to see it more and more. They're, they they just ch clapped and cheered for this this uh, New York Times bestselling book, The Battle of the Labyrinth. So they're going to, I promise you, all these kids are also watching Harry Potter, The Goblet of Fire. That's also about a, a labyrinth competition. We're going to review that in a minute as well. It's all introduction to the idea. It's a slow process. When I, when I use the word grooming, I'm not talking about sexuality. I'm talking about the grooming of the mind to understand these ideas, a, a, a slow initiation into the concepts. There was a terrorist attack in the city. It was one of three attacks that day across three different countries. A man drove a truck of explosives into an American factory just outside the city and beheaded a manager there. So, just... <laughs> and suddenly, the speech to children gets very, very adult. <laughs> These labyrinths are wonderful and amazing. By the way, there was a terrorist attack and some, somebody got beheaded. <sighs> Talk about poor segue. Ten days after we left a monument for peace and connection, there was an attack on peace in the same city. To everyone involved in this project, this was an affirmation of our work. To me, it was a not so subtle nod of the head that our mission was not only valid, but vital. Now, if you've been tuning me out this entire talk, please listen to this. Even if you don't go out and walk a labyrinth, my challenge to you is to keep an open mind to the unexpected. The whole theme of this conference is unexpected. That's why. TED Talks, TEDx, it's a branch of TED Talks. Keep an open mind to the unexpected. This is the moral of her story, if you will. You're here. And yet sometimes it can be so difficult, so easy to shut ourselves off from the new and unfamiliar, like a labyrinth. But if you keep an open mind to new knowledge and a new perspective, you can't imagine the connections you can create. I had a 40 year old woman tell me that one time when I was 18, when she was trying to get in my pants. Um, and she was, cause I, yeah, it's a long story, but I, I didn't let her, but the point is, it's almost the exact same speech, keeping an open mind for potential for future connections. Yeah. Very, very much grooming, uh, little phraseology here. Thank you. Yeah. So that's, you know, as you guys know, Ted talks is a huge platform, a huge series. They're, they're very much into everything that's i mean they're very much into one second guys um all, all forms of discussion and that their videos are promoted by youtube um everywhere okay let's see if i get this here we go all right so next we're going to look at labyrinths in pop culture uh they're they're everywhere she just mentioned a very a best-selling book right now that they're um, all about but they're also in some retro nostalgia you guys remember Pac-Man? What was the point of Pac-Man? You're going through the maze, trying to stay alive, trying to find the best path to stay alive and to avoid the ghosts, the unclean spirits, the Nephilim spirits, the demons trying to come get you. What was the idea of the Minotaur in the maze in ancient Crete? It was, for one, it was a sacrifice to the, to the gods to get it was child sacrifice but two there was a there was a demon there was a minotaur a monster that was chasing you around the maze to which the people who gave their children to the ancient Crete maze with the minotaur in it knew it was certain death the kids can't find their way out and they'll get attacked and eaten by the minotaur before they do it's pac-man children game fun game one of the one of the most recognition uh arcade and Atari games of all times being chased through a maze by ghosts trying to find the best way out and there is no way out what happens when you go out one of the edges you come back in the other side there's no way out of the maze you guys remember this the never ending story one of my favorite movies when i was a kid atreyu man i teared up when when artez the horse that got sucked into the swamp boy i was i was like seven years old and balling my eyes out it's like no no save it save artes and he's like pleading with artes he's like don't give up artes why won't you move because the nothing the nothing had gotten artes the hopelessness of the nothing that was destroying fantasia 
What was the nothing represented by? So the story of the story of the never ending story is about a young man who's reading a book. Oh, by the way, that book has it, it can be in, interpreted interpreted in multiple ways, either the hair of Medusa with the snakes or it's the, the snake eating its own tail, which is a symbol of the occult. The story is kid runs away. He's getting picked on. So he goes, hides out in a different part of, the, of some library or school or whatever. Um, old man lets him read this book and kind of the old man kind of points him to this book and, and tries to subtly entice the kid to start reading this book. And so the kid steals the book, runs away to another place in the attic and then holds up for the day on a rainy day while he's skipping school to read this book. And the book is about a hero that's chosen. Who's a boy hero that's chosen to go find the princess in the castle. And he has to overcome obstacles throughout his journey that cause him to look within himself, find his own strength and power. He's also with the impending threat of the wolf, which is the representation of the nothing that could find him and kill him at any time. The wolf, the same, the same thing the ancient Egyptians referred to in the book of Enoch as wolves that oppress the righteous. The same mythological god and creature that the the Greeks had a personification for, the big wolf. At the end of the story, as the, as the nothing continues to ravage the land of Fantasia and destroy more and more of this imagination world, what's left at the end of the day is a castle floating in the sky, which holds the queen. The queen in the sky, who also has the snake emblem on her forehead. And once Atreyu gets to the queen, it's up to the person, the kid reading the book, because it was an interactive book. It's up to the kid reading the book to give her a name, to acknowledge her through his own interpretation. What was the point of the labyrinth? That you insert your own, your own interpretation into it so you can define, you can find your own divinity. And what's the result? Once he inserts himself, he, there's even this moment here before he opens his windows in this upper attic where it's raining and he screams out Moonchild, which is the name that he screams out to give to this uh, princess in the floating castle. In the story, she then starts talking through the book to the kid reading the book saying, give me my name. You've got, and he's like, this is crazy. This is just a book. This can't be real. This is just a book. He it doesn't, it doesn't want me. It's not talking to me. Right. You guys remember the scene? Very, very powerful scene. And then he finally, in this emotional moment, he goes and he screams out the name of his mother, Moonchild. What was the Eye of Ra, Mystery Babylon, referred to the mother goddess in the sky, represented by Artemis, Hathor, Isis, the Queen of Heaven. And then when it's all said and done at the end of the movie, what happens after he's both the, the kid in the journey reading the book, as well as the reader of the book also overcomes his own issues with the bullies. And then the, the, the magical luck dragon Falcor shows up in real life at the end of the movie. And the kid who was formerly the reader of the book is now riding Falcor through the streets, scaring his bullies and overcoming his own personal struggles and is able to go to the mystical land of the gods of Fantasia. You're watching a 1980s poor graphic and animatronic <laughs> visual representation of the ancient labyrinth. What about Tron? 1980s, extremely bad CGI Tron. The point of the story is that a young man gets sucked into a computer game world where he's forced to compete in a maze-like competition, both on the floor and with the little light trails on their speeder bike, their light bikes that create a maze that they, if they hit the walls of the maze, they die. So he's, this is someone that's trapped in a game world who's forced to compete in maze-like structures and all of it while being chased by these bigger computer programs that they call demons. And all of it is from the master controller, the computer program, to which he claims at one point, you will each be part of me. Together, we will be complete. This is the main character 
once he ha- gets the help of Tron, one of the one of the computer game characters, so they can overcome the master controller. But the master controller who controls the games, whom in in this movie he says, "Well, I've one of my users tested me, so I pulled him in to our program because no one tests me." So the idea was that the video game itself pulled in the physical human user, just like the book is trying to pull in and have interact the reader interact with the book in Tron, the master controller, the master program pulls in the video game user because he was getting too much of a high score to test him has demons chases him, threatens his life with a maze in a game. And then says he wants to become, make him part of him so they can be complete. Right. So what same symbolism, the person that's going through the maze, the trials to overcome personal journey so that they can then become one with the cosmic unity, with the light. All the symbolism here in modern times, the shining, very famous movie, right? Very famous movie. Um, the shining is <laughs> very simple concept. This, this is actually a hotel in, in uh, Estes park, Colorado. I've actually driven by this place. I haven't gone to it, but I've driven by this place and it's, it's pretty wild. Um, supposedly it's, I've spoken to people that, cause when I used to work, um, in Denver, I had people that used to work at this place. One of my coworkers, she also had a second job at night at this place as one of the hotel maids or whatever. And she said, it's absolutely haunted. Like she'd be walking around completely alone and someone would grab the back of her hair or tap her on the shoulder or whatever she gets. She said, it's an absolutely haunted hotel. And this is where, this is the setting by which they wanted to film this movie. Um, the shining family is, uh, the premise of it is, is the family goes mother, father, and a child go to the shining, go to the, the hotel to stay, get trapped in a snowstorm. The child is playing on the carpet throughout the hallways, which is its own maze, its own labyrinth. Now, there's a lot more symbolism to this movie, but I'm just going over all the labyrinth that's put into this movie. Um, the the main protagonist, Jack, he's interacting with ghosts throughout the whole time. He just doesn't know it. They're constantly uh, chasing him at certain points. So he's been haunted by demons around the different hallways of the large hotel. And he becomes the Minotaur, even to the point of ramming his head through a door trying to kill his wife and child. He becomes, because he loses the personal journey and he's overtaken by the demon. And as his wife and child run to get away, he tries to look for them in the maze, which is a massive hedge garden outside of the hotel to which he ends up getting lost and freezes to death at the end of the movie. Only to find out later that he actually was an apparition himself and, um, and ultimately he was just reliving his death because he's trapped in the maze forever. Like I said, some of the esoteric philosophers and occultists that describe the idea of the labyrinth is that it's forever. And this, in this theology is there's always a way to self-improvement to get to the illumination. So it never stops because you did, they never get to the illumination part. You guys uh, saw, I'm not going to show you images from this series. I think they've made like nine or 10 movies of these. Um, but cause it's a, it's a graphic gory horror series that's been going on for like 20 years now. And uh, literally the little puppet jigsaw has a circular maze on his face. The whole thing is a sadistic series of games where people have to be honest with themselves and overcome past lies or deceits or affairs or traumas or whatever. So they can actually uh, win the game of their physical torture and entrapment and get out of it. But really they're never going to win the game. It's a sadistic labyrinth, both in the, in the practical, both in the symbolic as well as, yeah, everything involved. And no, this is not a modern picture of Madonna, but it's close. Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. In this particular installment of the Harry Potter series, uh, Harry is forced to compete in a in a maze labyrinth 
um, with the kid that ends up becoming the Batman. What was his name? The, the Twilight Sparkly kid. I can't remember his name right now. But um, he's the kid that's chasing. They're, they're, they're running through and they're chasing. And the labyrinth itself, the hedge garden itself that they're running through, tries to grab them and stop them and pull on them. And at, at one point, like instead of Harry winning, because he has to, get, if he wins, he gets like the, the power of the chalice or some cup or whatever. If you guys are Harry Potter fans out there, I'm sure you're going to, you know, be upset because I'm getting some of these concepts slightly wrong or I don't remember the name to the chalice or whatever. But point is, it gets, if he wins this, uh, this tri wizard tournament because they're all wizards anyway. So there's already the concept of magic is already there. And there's these nefarious forces trying to stop them from completing the maze. And the end of the maze is a point of light, a point of illumination. Uh, at the very end, he decides because he overcomes his own impersonal, uh, his own personal internal turmoil towards his competitor. Harry overcomes that to help them both complete at the same time and both have be the winner, basically. So all the symbolism is there with the concept of the labyrinth within Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. The Maze Runner. Do you guys remember this movie? This was a crazy one. This was an absolute crazy one. The Maze Runner. Um, this was a, I think, 2014, and uh, some boys that are trapped in the glade. So they they wake up in this open area where they're surrounded by these massive stone walls that move every day that are called the maze that they try to get out of. And so for this one, actually, there's we're going to look at a short little breakdown of the maze, uh, the maze runner, a little review. Okay, here we go. A teenager wakes up inside an underground elevator with no memory of his identity. A group of male youths greet him in a large grassy area called the Glade, enclosed by tall stone walls. The boys, also known as Gladers, have formed a rudimentary society with each assuming specialized tasks. Their leader, Albi, says that every boy eventually recalls his name but not his past. The boy learns that a vast maze surrounding them may be the only way out. During the day, designated runners search the maze for an escape route, returning before nightfall when the entrance closes. While in a competition with another boy named Galley, the boy suddenly remembers his name, Thomas. The next day, he is attacked by Ben, a runner who has been stung by a griever, deadly techno-organic creatures that roam the maze at night. Ben is forced into the maze and left to die, as there is no cure for his injury. Albie and Minnow, the lead runner, later retrace Ben's steps inside the maze. Minnow reappears at dusk, dragging Albie, who is stung, but they are unable to reach the closing entrance in time. Thomas runs into the maze to help, leaving all three trapped. Thomas lures a griever into a closing passageway, causing it to be crushed. The trio manage to survive the night, returning the next morning. The first ever girl arrives in the elevator. She recognizes Thomas, though he cannot remember her. Thomas, Minnow, and others enter the maze locate the griever corpse and remove a beeping mechanical device from inside it. Galley claims Thomas has jeopardized the fragile peace between the youths and the grievers and wants him punished. But Newt, the group's second in command, instead designates Thomas as a runner. Minnow shows Thomas a hand-constructed model of the maze based on previous exploration. The maze's numbered sections open and close in a regular sequence. Thomas realizes that the device corresponds to a section within the maze. Teresa has two syringes filled with an unknown substance. One is used on Albi and he recovers from the griever sting. Minnow and Thomas venture back into the maze with the device and discover a possible exit. That night, the maze entrance does not close while others open, letting grievers pour in. A massacre ensues as the gladers struggle to fight back or hide. Albi, Zart, and several others are killed. Afterwards, Galley punches Thomas and blames him for everything that happened. Thomas, who has had disconnected memory flashes since arriving, stabs himself with a severed griever stinger in an attempt to revive his memory. The others inject him with the last anti-venom. Unconscious, he recalls that he and Teresa worked for the organization that created the maze, WCKD. The boys unknowingly have been test subjects. Yes, the company that created the maze and put them in there is called Wicked. WCKD. <laughs> and of course, you're seeing the themes of the maze of the labyrinth here that uh, the, the archetype of Theseus is this um, the, the protagonist 
uh, who has to remember who he is and overcome the, the trials of working with the other boys and trying to figure out how to gather maze. And he then has to protect the girl he loves, just like Theseus was trying to protect uh, the princess from the Minotaur. So there's all the same, all the same philosophy and allegories here. Projects for an experiment. Thomas awakens and shares this information with Newt, Minnow, Chuck, and Teresa. Thomas then exposes himself and Teresa, confessing that they worked with WCKD and studied the boys for years. Meanwhile, Galley has taken command and intends to sacrifice Thomas and Teresa to the Grievers to restore the peace. And there's the sacrifice. What was the point about the friction in the ancient uh, Greek story was that the Athenians were being attacked by the Minoans and they could only create peace if the Athenians gave up seven boys and seven girls to be sacrificed to the Minotaur. Several gladers form a group and free them. They approach the maze in an attempt to find an escape, while Galley and a few others refuse to leave. Fighting grievers as they go, several teens are killed. The survivors eventually enter a laboratory strewn with corpses. In a video recording, a woman named Ava Page explains that the planet has been devastated by a massive solar flare, followed by a pandemic of a deadly virus called the flare. The teens learn that they were part of an experiment studying for a cure. Paige is seen shooting herself on the screen as the lab is attacked by armed men. Galley suddenly appears with a gun. Having been stung by a griever, he insists they must stay in the maze and aims at Thomas, but is pierced through the chest by Minnow's spear. Chuck is fatally shot as Galley's gun discharges. Masked armed men then rush in and take the rest of the... So you do have the sacrifice of the boys, even though they found a way out of the maze, one of them is um, convinced that they have to stay there because this is the manipulation of the philosophy of the, of the labyrinth is that you you never leave. Same with the shining, same with, uh, you know, the, the, these different concepts about like you, the idea was that you truly a true labyrinth allegory is that you never really get out of it. Uh, you're always there trying to find the gods. Elevator with no memory of his identity. A group of male youths greet him in a large grassy area called the Glade, enclosed by tall men rush in and take the rest of the group to a helicopter. It flies over a vast desert wasteland and approaches a ruined city. The scene... And yes, the maze is in a massive desert. ...ends with the supposedly dead scientists meeting in a room. Page notes that the experiment is successful. The survivors are now entering phase two. So the end of it you see that it was all a test because that's what they considered the labyrinths to be back in the day it was a test to to see what you're made of your own power and strength as you strive towards illumination so that's uh, all the all the same symbolism is there it's pretty pretty amazing but what does our heavenly father say he tells us that Proverbs 15, 19, the ways of the slothful man is as a hedge of thorns. But the way of the righteous is made plain. Or some versions will say is a upright highway, a straight highway. But, a, but the way of the slothful man, sometimes called the lazy man or the, or the worthless man, is a hedge of thorns. Interesting, huh? What about Proverbs 22, 5? Thorns and snares lie on the path of the perverse. He who guards his soul stays far from them. What is a hedge maze? Thorns and snares. What is the point of the maze? The demon is trying to get you. The ideas of the maze closing in on you is to snare you, to trap you there. It's the maze itself is a trap. So I know that the word maze is not being used in Proverbs 22. I know that I get that. The word labyrinth isn't being used. It's the same concept. Thorns and snares lie on the path of the perverse because it's not a straight way. You walk in circles or you walk through a winding way never to find yourself, never to get out, never to find illumination. But he who guards his soul stays far from them. Judges 2, 1 through 3. Look what the angel tells rebellious Israel. Now the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal. We're going to talk about that word Gilgal in a minute to Bochim and said, I brought you up out of Egypt and led you into the land that I had promised to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And you are not to make a covenant with the people of this land, but you shall tear down their altars. Yet you've not obeyed my voice. What is this you have done? 
So now I tell you that I will not drive out these people before you. They will be thorns in your sides, and their gods will be a snare to you. Revelation 9, 3 through 6. After the beast comes out of the pit during the 42 months, verse 3, and out of the smoke the locusts descended on the earth, and they were given power like that of the scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any plant or tree, but only those who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. So these are the rebellious. These are those who do not like God, do not want anything to do with his ways. The locusts were not given power to kill them, but only torment them for five months. Their torment was like the stinging of a scorpion. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, but death will escape them. They're trapped. After the, the demons catch them. So this brings us to the point of the labyrinth, which I'm very excited to present. It's a war for wisdom. This is what we're in. So the, how this works out, First Enoch 9, 1 through 6. Pre-flood, rebellious angels came down. Verse, not, verse 1 through 6. Then Michael, Ura, Raphael, and Gabriel looked down from heaven and saw much blood being shed upon the earth, all lawlessness being wrought upon the earth. They said, one to another, the earth made without inhabitants cries. The voice of their crying rises to the gates of heaven. And now to you, the holy ones of heaven, the souls of men make their suit, saying, bring our cause before the Most High. And they said to the Lord of the ages, Lord of lords, God of gods and king of kings and God of the ages, the throne of your glory stands unto all the generations of the ages. Your name and holy, your name holy and glorious and blessed unto all the ages. You have made all things and you have power over all things. And all things are naked and open in your sight. And you see all things. Nothing can hide itself from you. You see what Azazel has done. He has taught all unrighteousness on earth and has revealed the eternal secrets which were preserved in heaven which men were striving to learn. So before the flood, Azazel, whom we see after the flood, is referred to as the dragon of Revelation 13. He was ready to reveal the secrets of heaven, which men were striving to learn. That is the same point of the labyrinth. Men are looking for illumination. They're looking for, like, like we read, the they all, the esoteric philosophers and occultists all describe it in the same way. It's the connection between your inner self and the gods and goddess, the realm of the gods and goddesses, the pathway to the divine. It's a symbolic practice of meditation from ancient Babylon, is the labyrinth. So that because men who are striving not through the route of the wisdom of the straight path of Yahweh, but perverse men whom allow the gods to become a snare to them. Thank you, Jed, for the super chat. I appreciate that, brother. Thank you. Deuteronomy 16, 18 through 22. You are to appoint judges and officials for your tribes in every town that the Lord your God has given you. They are to judge the people with righteous judgment. Do not deny justice or show partiality. Do not accept a bribe. For a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of the righteous. Pursue justice and justice alone, so that you may live, and you may possess the land that the Lord your God has given you. Do not set up any wooden ashra pole next to the altar you will build for the Lord your God, and do not set up for yourselves a sacred pillar, which the Lord your God hates. In ancient Egypt, the ashra pole is the, the pillar of Hathar. Very decorative. Inscribed roundabouts. And an adaptation of the iconic pillar framework at the top that became the head uh, known as Hathar. What did we describe in part 20 of the series? Hathar was the physical manifestation or the physical representation of Mother Babylon. Thank you, um, 
LJ Angela, thank you. Thank you, brother. Thanks for the super chat. Appreciate that. Very generous. In ancient Egypt, the pillars within their temples were the Asherah poles. Judges chapter 3, verse 4 through 7. These nations were left to test the Israelites to find out whether they would keep the commandments of the Lord, which he had given their fathers through Moses. Thus, the Israelites continued to live among the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. They took the daughters of these people in marriage, gave their own daughters to their sons, and served their gods. So the Israelites did evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God, and they served the Baals and the Asherah. What did we talk about last time? The Baal, the Apis bull, also called Molech. The bull with the disc on the top, representing Anubis and Ra from ancient Egypt. And there was a pole that went along with it. It was the pillars of the Asherah. Now, the Egyptians had a different name for it, so I'm going to get to that in just a minute. It's going to all make sense. So, the Asherah was a huge deal in ancient Israel as a part of their rebellion against Yahweh's covenant. Second Kings chapter 17, verse 14 through 17. But they would not listen. They stiffened their necks like their fathers, who did not believe the Lord their God. They rejected his statutes and the covenant he had made with their fathers, as well as the decrees he had given them. They pursued worthless idols and became worthless, going after the surrounding nations that the Lord had commanded them not to imitate. They abandoned all the commandments of the Lord their God and made for themselves two cast idols of calves and an Asherah pole. They bowed down to all the host of heaven and served Baal. They sacrificed their sons and daughters in the fire and practiced divination and soothsaying. They devoted themselves to doing evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. What did we read earlier, guys? The labyrinth is connected to Anubis. That's the Baal, the Molech character that they sacrificed the children to. The labyrinth represented the journey, the path to the wisdom of the gods, the illumination of the gods. That's the wisdom. Their so-called wisdom. Oh, Jesse, I appreciate the super chat. Thank you so much for that. 2 Kings 21, 3 through 7. For Manasseh rebuilt the high places that his father Hezekiah had destroyed, and he raised up altars for Baal. He made an Asherah pole, as King Ahab of Israel had done, and he worshipped and served all the host of heaven. Manasseh also built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord had said in Jerusalem, I will put my name. In both courtyards of the house of the Lord, he built altars to all the hosts of heaven. He sacrificed his own son in the fire, practiced sorcery and divination, consulted mediums and spiritists. He did great evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. Manasseh even took the carved Asherah pole he had made and set it up in the temple. The ultimate disgrace to Yahweh. Why? The Asherah pole is a physical representation of Mother Babylon, the home of Ra, and it represented the wisdom, the law of Me'at, the wisdom of the gods. You guys remember we talked about investigating Babylon, the Dejed the, the pillar? This was probably two years ago at this, a year and a half at this point, part seven of the Investigating Babylon series. I talked about how there were some Egyptian writings that I couldn't quite understand yet. It didn't make sense to me yet. I didn't understand the, 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 the excuse me, the Dejed pillar and how it related to Osiris because at other times it talked about other people being related to it. And, and I, all I knew is that it somehow was related to the resurrection of Osiris and the, the power and strength that they gave to Osiris also sometimes uh, related to his pata. And, after researching the Asherah pole and putting together everything about that, I realized exactly what it is. It's the Egyptian Asherah pole. So, for those of you who have been watching me for years, I, from a year and a half ago to now, I've learned something. I figured out something. The Dejerid pillar of ancient Egypt is the Asherah pole mentioned in the Old Testament. And I'll show you that right here. In the Osiris myth, Osiris was killed by Set, being tricked into a coffin made to fit Osiris exactly. 
Set then had the coffin with the now deceased Osiris flung into the Nile. The coffin was carried by the Nile to the ocean and onto the city of Byblos in Lebanon. It ran around a ground and sacred tr- and a sacred tree took root and rapidly grew around the coffin and closed the coffin within its trunk. The king of the land, intrigued by the tree's quick growth, ordered the tree cut down and installed as a pillar in his palace, unaware that the tree contained Osiris's body. Meanwhile, Isis searched for Osiris, aided by Anubis, and discovered Osiris's location in Byblos. Isis maneuvered herself into the favor of the king and queen and was granted a boon. She asked for the pillar in the palace hall, and upon being granted it, she extracted the coffin from the pillar. She then consecrated the pillar, anointed it with myrrh, and wrapping it with linen. The pillar came to be known as the Pillar of the Jed, because it was attributed that the dead body inside caused the, uh, the pillar to be sacred. From another historian of Egyptian mythology, Cox says that the Jed came to be associated with Seeker, the falcon god of the Memphite necropolis, and then with Ptah, the Memphite patron god of craftsmen. Ptah was often referred to as the noble Djed and carried a scepter that was a combination of the Djed symbol and the Ankh, the symbol of life. Ptah gradually came to be assimilated into Osiris, and by the time of the New Kingdom, the Djed was firmly associated with Osiris. So that means it wasn't originally associated with Osiris. That's what threw me off in the past. Because I studied the Bible more than I do Egyptian mythology. But as I continued with all the studies involved in this series, it finally clicked. Oh, yes, the allegories and all the personifications of the gods in different forms, their different avatars. Yes, that means there was an original and then it becomes other things over time as new kingdoms take over. As they talked about the idea of the, the allegories of these teachings of the labyrinth takes on different forms in different cultures. And I was like, okay, that makes perfect sense. And that's why it looks the way it does. It's wrapped in different colors. And in the same way, they treated the astral pole in Canaan. Then I found actual hieroglyphs where the, the, the Jed had the head of Hathar. In different representations of the Dejed. This is the Ashra pole. Hathar is the representation of Mother Babylon. The Dejed pillar symbolizes the wisdom, the strength, the stability, the fertility of the kingdom. This is why in ancient Egypt they had this ritual where they would raise in the in the temples next to the king's seat, they would they would have this uh ceremony where they would raise the Dejed pillar and set it beside the king's seat. What is the Ark of the Covenant in Scripture? It's the king's seat. What is Yahweh, the king of Israel? He says, do not put one of these pillars next to my altar. That's what the Egyptians did, the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, Babylon. That's their practice to take the wisdom, the strength, the prominence. Remember how we talked about in in part 20 in Babylon has fallen. We talked about the queen of heaven and how when quote unquote the eye of Ra moved over the land of the ancient egyptians it would cause the inundation of the flood and therefore they attributed their prosperity and their prominence their agricultural blessing they attributed to the queen of heaven they consider that the stability of their nation in the same way the rep- the physical representation in addition to statues of hathor they put Hathor as the Dejed, the Dejed pillar. Now, there's also a few representations of other gods, Anubis, uh, Osiris, and even Ra as the Dejed pillar as well. But they're all a part of the quote-unquote godhead that ruled over Egypt through the authority of the Queen of Heaven and the power and the ma'at, the wisdom, the law, the ethics that came from the Queen of Heaven. No wonder Yahweh says, do not put one of those sacred trees or one of those Dejed Asherah pillars in my house next to my altar. Why? Because he has his own law. He has his own ethics. 
his ways, his laws are higher than the Egyptians or the Babylonians. He doesn't deal in mystery understandings to, to tempt you with a carrot through a maze to find illumination. He tells you the straight path and wants you to follow it. Parallels have also been drawn between the Dejeb pillar and various items in other cultures. Sidney Smith in 1922, the first suggested a parallel with the Assyrian sacred tree when he drew attention to the presence of the upper four bands of the Dejeb pillar and the bands that are present in the center of the vertical portion of the tree. He also proposed a common origin between Osiris and the Assyrian god Asher, with whom he said the sacred tree might be associated. I got the sighting down below. We've already we've already made this association back in a part seven, our investigating Babylon series. when we talk about the many different names of Osiris throughout different cultures. Asher is one of them. This is the sacred assembly or the sacred tree of the Assyrians that we see in hieroglyphs. It's just the Dejed pillar of the Egyptians. It's the Asherah pillar of Canaanites. No, it's not a Christmas tree guys. <laughs> this represented mother Babylon. They're not decorating it with lights. This was this whole thing was a something they wrapped in a specific type of linen, bathed in myrrh, and set it beside. This is why you have the, the dignitaries always rep, uh, dealing with this sacred tree and these Assyrian glyphs, because it was next to the throne of the king to represent the law code by which he adjudicated and ran his kingdom. This was him acknowledging my thoughts, my wisdom, my ethics comes from Ma'atz, from the home of Ra. No, we do not teach that this is a Christmas tree. It's a different tradition. There's a whole history to the Christmas tree. Let's not go into that, guys. The Dejeb pillar is the Asherah pole of Baal. This is why they're always worshiping it. This is why it's always next to their rulers. This is why in this depiction here, we see Ra, the falcon or the hawk-headed god, Ra, which represents Satan or the father patron god of Egypt. That's why they're making such ado about this thing. It represents their wisdom, their law their philosophy. It's literally the counter of Yahweh's law, Yahweh's wisdom, Yahweh's straight path. Here's Hathor as one of the pillars of ancient Egypt. Here's Hathor as one of the sacred pillars in the temples everywhere. They literally constructed the temples with the pillars of the Eshra or the Hathor or the Dejed. Here's Hathor holding up the entire structure everywhere. These represent Mother Babylon, guys. They gave homage. They gave their little nod to Mother Babylon, the home of Ra, in their pillars that held up their temples. because it represented the wisdom of their kingdom and their God, Ra. More pillars with Hathor on it. All these amazing pillars. I'm, I'm, I'm impressed with the artwork, don't get me wrong, but like I'm not, I'm not impressed to, to, to abandon worship to my God, but I'm impressed with the artwork. But if you see at the bottom left-hand corner of this uh, cylindrical pillar, or not cylindrical, but the, uh, the square-shaped blocked-off pillar, you can see the Dejed representation down there on the bottom. There's three of them bunched up next to each other. But the whole thing was symbolic of the Asherah pole. Here's a, them showing the ceremony of raising the Dejed in the palace. Them giving homage. Thank you, Lisa, for the super chat. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Here's the Greek architecture, but you see Diana at the top of the pillars. And then you see some of the classical pillar designs. But this is why they, just in case you're ever wondering, by the way, here's the, the labyrinth you see above the pillars. You see the labyrinths and the artwork. 
and as well as on the the banner you can see the labyrinths above the actual pillars all this is allegorical symbolism was connected and that's the reason for it because they believe that you cannot describe the gods with concrete terms that you must show allegories and myths to explain them it was a part of their religious philosophy their esoteric philosophy we're going to go into that here right now here's another uh, wonderful example of the queen of heaven literally as the pillar that holds up their temples why why make her the pillar if she represents the home of ra if she represents the wisdom and knowledge of the egyptian law code why put her as the pillar the wisdom of the ashra is built upon philosophy and negation theology so we see the ashra as the pillars that hold up all the temples because it's a representative of their way of thinking, their philosophy and their theology. So let's look, what is negation theology? This is about to get really wild. So I'm glad if anyone's still here, I'm glad you're still here. We haven't even gotten to the best mind blowing part from the scriptures that we're gonna get to here in a few minutes. Rabbinic theology. This is Maimonides from the 13th century AD. The principle that inspired his philosophical activity, Maimonides was identical to a fundamental tenet of scholasticism. There can be no contradiction between the truths which God has revealed and the findings of the human mind in science and philosophy. This was what Maimonides thought. Maimonides primarily relied upon the science of Aristotle and the teachings of the Talmud, commonly claiming to find a basis for the, for the latter in the former. So the creator of modern day Judaism, the one who codified the 13 required beliefs of Judaism, a philosopher who relied on something called scholasticism, we're going to break that down, claimed he was relying upon the science of Aristotle and the teachings of the Talmud. And he claims that the Talmud had its basis in the teachings of Aristotle. What's scholasticism? It's a medieval school of philosophy that employed a critical organic method of philosophical analysis predicated upon the Aristotelian 10 categories. Christian scholasticism emerged within the monastic schools that translated scholastic Judeo-Islamic philosophies and thereby rediscovered the collected works of Aristotle. Endeavoring to harmonize his metaphysics and its account of prime mover with the Latin Catholic dogmatic Trinitarian theology. These monost monostatic schools became the basis of the earliest European medieval universities, contributing to the development of modern science. Scholasticism dominated education in Europe from about 1100 to 1700. I'm going to read that again, guys. <laughs> So the Aristotelian 10 categories, we're going to look at what that is. So this is a hermeneutic. This is the way they, they taught themselves. They went off the 10 categories of Aristotle. And this concept of scholasticism endeavored to harmonize the metaphysics of Aristotle. That means things speaking, speaking of the supernatural. The word metaphysics is an old word for supernatural. So this scholasticism moving upon the principles of the philosopher, the Greek philosopher, Aristotle, attempted to harmonize metaphysics, Aristotle's metaphysics, and its account of a prime mover with the Latin Catholic dogmatic Trinitarian theology. These monastic tools became the base of early European medieval universities. Scholasticism, based on the Aristotelian 10 categories. Number one, the substance. Is this ringing a bell with anybody? Who's been watching all these conversations I've been having with Trinitarians for the last three, four years? Why it took so long in some of those interviews just to get down to them explaining what they actually believe when they refer to God? And they call him the essence. 
They say he has a different substance than everything else. I'm not going to break down every single one of these 10 because we got to move on to some other things, but I'm going to do a whole separate video on Maimonides. I'm going to do a whole separate video on the roots of Trinitarian theology from this philosophical perspective. Just giving you the overview right now. But this is why they they emphatically tell you that the essence is the most important part of the Trinitarian ideology. And Maimonides, relying on Aristotelian philosophy, tried to harmonize the supernatural of that concept with what the Latin Catholics were claiming about the Trinity. What do they claim about the Trinity? That it's the essence of the Godhead, the substance of the God, which is different from all things, and that that's how he can be fully human and fully God, because it's a different substance. It's a different essence. This is why sometimes in these discussions on my channel, you've heard me interviewing or debating with uh, Trinitarian believers, and I tell them, okay, well, give me in Scripture that third essence, because I've never seen it from Scripture. It says that God's a spirit, the angels are spirits, we're going to be resurrected and glorified with our eternal bodies and a spiritual body. And then there's humanity in the flesh made of the earth. There's only two categories, the earthy and the spirit. So what's this other essence that they keep referring to that, that they say you must believe that the father, son, and the Holy spirit are of the same essence. Otherwise you're anathema. You're heretical. That's the, that's what they always go back to right? It's just ancient philosophy, guys, literally. And now I'm going to show you how far back this goes. It's mind blowing. Uh, number two, quantity, three, qualification, four, relative. Again, I can't have, I don't have time to break all these down. Five, the where or the place, six, when, seven, relative position. That's interesting, right? Because that's a, based upon perception of the viewer. Number eight, having or the state of a condition. Number nine, the doing or the action. Number 10, the be affected, the affection of so these are the, these are the hermeneutic categories in which they're thinking like oh if we apply this this system that Aristotle came up with with trying to determine the metaphysics of Aristotle's hermeneutic approach with why these Latin Catholics are so dogmatic on the Trinity because they're describing the same thing. Scholasticism was initially a program conducted by medieval Christian thinkers attempting to harmonize the various authorities of their own tradition and to reconcile Christian theology with classical and late antiquity philosophy, especially that of Aristotle, but also of Neoplatonism. Maimonides' admiration for the Neoplatonic commentators led him to doctrines which the later scholastics did not accept. For instance, Maimonides was an adherent of apophatic theology. In this theology, one attempts to describe God through negative attributes. For instance, one should not say that God exists in the usual sense of the term. It can be said that God is non, non-existent. One should not say that God is wise, but it can be said that God is not ignorant. Does this, does this sound logical to you guys? So this is something called ap apophatic theology. We're going to break this down as well. That's why I said, I know that some of this stuff can seem heady, but investigating Babylon was our overview. This is where we're going to dig. Okay. So um, introducing new terms and ideas as we look throughout history and different concepts and how these things came to be. So we're going to have to learn new terms. But according to apophatic theology, which is called negation theology, and this was where Maimonides got his idea of rabbinic negation the way in which you speak about God from a philosophical perspective that you would not say God is wise, but instead you'd say God is not ignorant. It may even lead you not to ever say his name out loud. Another uh, Platonist, which is where the Neoplatonism came from, from the third century AD, Neoplatonism was a mystical or contemplative form of Platonism, which developed outside of the mainstream of academic Platonism. 
It started with the writings of Platonus, which is about the third century AD, and ended with the closing of the Platonic Academy by Emperor Justinian in 529 AD, when the pagan traditions were ousted. It's a product of Hellenistic syncretism, which developed due to the crossover between Greek thought and the Jewish scriptures, and also gave birth to Gnosticism. Whoa, lo and behold. Where'd Gnosticism come from? Philosophical Platonism, trying to synchronize Greek philosophy with the scriptures. That's why, I, yeah, I, I just, I'm going to do a whole video on the Trinity. Proclus was the last head of the Platonic uh, Academy. His student, Pseudo Dionysus, had a far stretching Neoplatonic influence on Christianity and Christian mysticism. So let's look at the philosophy of apophatic theology. Apophatic theology, also known as negative theology, is a form of theological thinking and a religious practice which attempts to approach God, the divine, by negation, to speak only in terms of what may not be said about the perfect goodness that is God. It forms a pair together with cataphatic theology, which approaches God or the divine by affirmations or positive statements about what God is. The the apophatic tradition is often, though not always, allied with the approach of mysticism, which aims at the vision of God, the perception of the divine reality beyond the realm of ordinary perception. I'm trying to harmonize the metaphysics. Apophatic theology, as pseudo Dionysius describes the cataphatic or the affirmative way to the divine as the way of speech, that we can come to some understanding of the transcendence by attributing all the perfections of the created order to God as its source. And this is where Gnosticism always refers to God as the source. In this sense, we say God is love, God is beauty, God is good. The apophatic or negative way stresses God's absolute transcendence and unknowability in such a way that we cannot say anything about the divine essence because God is so totally beyond being. Does that, does that sound familiar, guys? You see me debate Trinitarians? Not, not the average person who thinks they believe in the Trinity but can't really describe it, but theologically trained Trinitarians? When they talk about the essence of God, the divinity of God, when you say you question the divinity of Christ because you're, you won't put him in this little special ontological group of divine substance and essence, so therefore you're questioning his divinity. The apophat, apophat, apophatic way of negation stresses God's absolute transcendence and unknowability. You guys remember when I, when I plug and I start pursuing the Trinitarian? And I show them, okay, can, but what you're saying is not in Scripture. Can you express to me from Scripture what you're saying? And they say, hey, there's some things that are mysteries. We, we can't know everything. It's not, God isn't, you can't know everything about God. He's a mystery. This is, not, this is something that was trained to them, that's passed down throughout history. This is not something they just all just conveniently just started saying at the same time. Different conversations with me. Um, Melissa, thank you so much for the super chat. I appreciate that. But as they say, the transcendence of God is so absolute and unknowable that we can't say anything about the divine essence. So even in their description of saying it, throwing their hands up to say it's a mystery, they acknowledge this concept of the divine essence of God and that he's beyond being. What have you guys heard me say when we talk and I ask a Trinitarian, can you show me this other essence in scripture? Because scripture doesn't talk about another essence. And they say, well, he's, he's not created, so he's, he's beyond everything that's created. He's unknowable. The dual concept of the immanence and the, the, the dual concept, that's a Gnostic concept of duality. The dual concept of the immanence and the transcendence of God can help us to understand the simultaneous truth of both ways to God. At the same time, as God is immanent, God is also transcendent. At the same time, as God is knowable, God is also unknowable. You guys, God cannot be thought of as one or the other only. You guys recognize some of this philosophy? 
the double speak. This is apophatic theology. It's a form of old school philosophy. It's double speak. In fact, uh, for my other channel, The Brave Believer, um, I'm getting a shirt made up that says resist peak double speak. This is just Gnosticism, guys. It's double speak. Oh, yeah, we can go know. We can know God. Sure, we can. But uh, when you try to get me to actually define him from his words, suddenly we can't know God. He's a mystery. I don't know. I don't know what this other essence or substance is, but I, you, you must believe in it. You must believe in it or you're not saved. You guys have heard that before, right? You've seen it before? You've seen what? What? how does their mind entertain this stuff? It sounds like absolute contradictory speech. Yeah, it's literally a part of the philosophy that it's not built. It's not built off the scriptures. It's built off something else. Apophatic, excuse me, apophatic, <laughs> apophatic theology and Christian mysticism. Pseudo Dionysius, the Areopagite from the fifth century. The early church fathers were influenced by Philo, and Meredith even states that Philo is the real founder of apophatic tradition. Yet it was Pseudo Dionysius, the Areopagite, and the Maximus, the confessor, whose writings shaped both hesychasm and the contemplative tradition of the Eastern Orthodox churches. The contemplative tradition is meditation, and the mystical traditions of Western Europe that apophatic theology became a central element of Christian theology and contemplative practice. What is the labyrinth? It's a contemplative practice, a spiritual path, a spiritual journey where you release, receive, and return. It's based, it's a philosophical walking of the philosophical idea. It says, excuse me, it's a, a, a literal walking pathway of the philosophical ideas. And in the same way as it is both apophatic and cataphatic, meaning both negation and affirmation, you end up just walking in circles because it cancels each other out. Because you end up having to say, well, I can't really know God, but yeah, he's knowable, but um, I can't really know him. I'm the crazy guy over here saying, if God told you, he, he, he expects that you can learn it and know it. He didn't speak over your head. He told you very simply, this is what you should do. He didn't tell you to walk in circles and trying to find your way out. He said, I make the way straight. Follow my commandments. Apophatic theology found its most influential expression in the works of Pseudo Dionysius, the Arabite, in the late 5th, early 6th century, a student of Proclus, who combined a Christian worldview with Neoplatonic ideas. There's that, there's that Neoplatonic thing again that Maimonides was so impressed by. He's a constant factor in the contemplative tradition of the Eastern Orthodox churches, and from the 9th century onwards, his writing also had a strong impact on Western mysticism. According to Corrigan and Harrington, two researchers, Dionysius' central concern is how a triune God is utterly unknowable and unrestricted being beyond individual substances, beyond even goodness, can become manifest to in and through the whole of creation in order to bring back all things to the hidden darkness of their source. I'm going to read that again. This dude, so influential in this type of thinking in the early Christian church of Orthodox mysticism, attributes this is her, his hermeneutic to try to figure out the Trinity. Dionysius' central concern is how a triune God utterly unknowable, unrestricted being, beyond individual substances, beyond even goodness, can become manifest to, in, and through the whole of creation in order to what? In order to bring us to salvation? In order to bring us to the, the immortal light that Revelation 22 talks about in Isaiah 60? In order to bring us into his house, the new Jerusalem? That we live forever in the land of reality with the Father and the Son? Nope, that's not what he says. In order to bring back all things to the hidden hidden darkness of their source. This is absolute Gnostic language, guys. To return to the source. Just like in the Matrix, when he says, I give you my body back. He's talking to the big glowing, the big black orb with spikes coming out of it, who's the source, has the, the, the cherub face talking to him. 
And he's like, yeah, you can take my body and put it back into the source. Pure Gnosticism. Drawing on Neoplatonism, Pseudo Dionysius described human ascent to divinity as the progress of purgation, the human ascent to divinity, illumination and union. This is literally the philosophies of the labyrinth. Another Neoplatonic influence was his description of the cosmos as a series of hierarchies, which overcame the distance between God and humans. The Christological dogma. You guys ever heard me uh, doing a discussion with uh, Trinitarians and they want to talk about Christology? Here's the terms. The Christological dogma, formulated by the Fourth Ecumenical Council held in Chalcedon in 451, is based on diophysitism and hypostatic union, concepts used to describe the union of humanity and divinity in a single hypostasis or individual existence, that of Jesus Christ. This remains transcendent to our rational categories, a mystery which has to be guarded by apophatic language. So, it's a personal union of a singular unique kind. What do we talk about with Maimonides being impressed by apo apophatic theology? Relying on scholasticism, which relied on the ten categories of Aristotle hermeneutics. What do we see here? Them, the first category was the substance, the essence. Them trying to have a council on determining the substance or the essence of how Jesus could possibly be God in the flesh while uh, fully God at the same time, which he was not. He dethroned his divinity, and he came down to be a man in the flesh while he's in the flesh. That's why he could be tempted. That's why he had to overcome with obedience. That's why he had to learn and grow in wisdom and stature. This is, But they ignore the scriptures because they're pushing a philosophy they're pushing hypostatic union of the essence because they say it remains transcendent to our rational categories. So they have to go to philosophical Aristotelian categories, which is their hermeneutic of scholasticism under the guise of apophatic theology. This remains transcendent to our rational categories, a mystery which has to be guarded by apophatic language. A mystery. Nothing new under the sun, guys. Oh, by the way, I found a I found a hilarious meme. Um the the apophatic god is you don't know me, bro. <laughs> oh, <it's> so good. <laughs> Yeah, if you truly held to apophatic theology, <laughs> this would be the this would be the God you serve. You, you don't know me, bro. <laughs> so good. <laughs> what does Colossians 2 8 say? See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, which are based on human tradition and the spiritual forces of the world rather than on Christ. Second Timothy 2.14, remind the believers of these things, charging them before God to avoid quarreling over words, which succeeds only in leading the listeners to ruin. You think it's a you think it's a quarrel created when someone says, You can know God, but you can't really know him. You got to believe in the substance and the essence of the hypostatic union, but I can't explain it to you because it's a mystery. You think that leads to quarreling over words? How about 1 Timothy 6, 3-5? If anyone teaches another doctrine and disagrees with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and with godly teaching, he is conceited and understands nothing. Instead, he has an unhealthy interest in controversies and what? Semantics. That's quarreling over words. What have you guys heard me say so many times arguing with Trinitarians? Brother, you're just arguing semantics. You just want me to say, you just want me to describe God in a, with a specific sets of words. But then when I describe God with another set of words that mean the exact same things, you don't like that. But you want me to describe them with a specific set of words. They're arguing over semantics. Out of which come envy, strife, abusive talk. Some of you guys have probably seen that abusive talk on some of my more recent videos where I went into an Orthodox Trinitarian group and tried to share with them some challenging questions. 
and the abusive talk came out. Evil suspicions. They immediately suspect that you're Jehovah's Witness, that you're Mormon, that you're of a different faith, that you're denigrating the deity of Yeshua, that you're trampling on the blood of Christ, that you're they immediately come to you with accusation. That's evil suspicion. Constant friction between men of depraved minds who are devoid of the truth. These men regard godliness as a means of gain. Vain philosophies, semantics, arguing over words. These, this, this comes from somewhere, guys. This isn't just a naturally occurring phenomenon amongst people that I've talked to. This, is, this, is, this comes from places. This is longstanding fruit of this theology, of this apophatic theology of negation. Thank you so much, Chase, for the super chat. I really appreciate that. <laughs> I appreciate that, brother. Hopefully everyone else feels the same. Let's look at, guess what? Do you think the Egyptians did their own negation? We've already talked about medieval negation with Maimonides and how he traced it back to the 4th, 5th, 6th century early church fathers. And then they traced it back to Aristotle, 6th century BC. Think we can trace it back even further? How about Egyptian negation? You guys remember we talked about Ma'at, part 20? Ma'at, the ancient Egyptian concept of truth, balance, order, harmony, law, morality, and justice. Literally the philosophical and theological framework from which the Dejed pillar represented. Ma'at was also the goddess who personified these concepts and regulated the stars, the seasons, the actions of mortals, the deities who had brought order from chaos at the moment of creation. Pharaohs are often depicted with the emblem of Ma'at to emphasize their role in upholding the laws and righteousness. From And that's not the righteousness of God, guys. From the 18th dynasty, Ma'at was described as the daughter of Ra. So this, this is eight, nine hundred 900 years before Aristotle. Ma'at was described as the daughter of Ra, indicating her that pharaohs were believed to rule through her authority. Remember what we talked about. Who's the daughter of Ra? Who? It's Mother Babylon. It's the Eye of Ra, from which comes magic and pharmakia, the cosmic order, the governing authorities of the nations, the laws and ethics by which they abided by. That's why they put the Ashra or the Dejed pillar next to their thrones and the worship. All of it stems from Mother Babylon. All of it stems from the Ma'at, the expectation of behavior governed by Ma'at. And what do you know, guys? Ma'at has an entire list of 42 negative confessions from her law. E Egyptian negation theology. As you can see here, I'm not going to read through all these. You can screenshot it and read it, but this is just basically what someone at the end of their life would want to recite the negative confessions of Ma'at through which they would basically say they qualify for to be judged favorably in the underworld. They've not done wrong. They've not robbed. I have not stolen. I have not slain people. I have not destroyed the food of offerings. I have not reduced measures. I have not stolen the God's property. The 42 negative confessions of Ma'at. This is Egyptian negation theology. This is the heart of the philosophy that the Greeks passed to the Latins, the the, those in Rome, whom the early church fathers tried to harmonize with the Hebrew scriptures, to which later is picked up by Judaism. It's the foundation of the Trinity theology. It's the negation. Negative attributes about yourself, your life, and about the gods so that you can find favor with the gods. All of this was based on Worship of the unknowable God, whom you can know, but it's a mystery. You have to overcome the internal personal struggles and follow Ma'at so that you can be recognized by the God and escape the demons who torment your soul in the Egyptian underworld. The labyrinth on the ground is a physical representation of ancient Egyptian theology to control you, to motivate you through fear 
and control your mind, never leading you to truth, dangling the carrot of elimination. And it's done not just through what's taught on the outside, but what they instruct you to say with your mouth. All of it's devoid of Yahweh. All of it is outside of the truth. First Timothy 6, 20 through 21. O Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you. Avoid irreverent, irrever irreverent, empty chatter and opposing arguments of so-called knowledge, which some have professed and thus swerved away from the faith. Grace be with you all. The Ashropole, the symbolism of, of Hathor, the queen of heaven, represented their knowledge and their wisdom, what they considered knowledge. They put it next to they put it next to their king's throne in their in their house, the houses of their gods or their kings. What did Yahweh say? Put the book of the Ark of the Covenant. Put the book of the covenant into the, the chest of the ark. Yahweh's law sits within his bosom, under his seat. He doesn't want the wisdom of Egypt. The wisdom of Babylon represented as a pillar next to him, a sacred tree next to him. He has his law, his expectation of righteousness within him, in his seat of authority, where his name is placed. This is a perversion of what the creator of heaven and earth used for his throne, made as a copy on the earth. Revelation 3, 10 through 12. Because you've kept my command to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of testing that is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. I'm coming soon. That word is this word takios in the Greek doesn't mean the day after it means when he comes, it's going to happen like lightning from the east to the west. He's going to happen quickly. Hold fast to what you have so that no one will take your crown. Crown of what? Is this the, is this the triple crown of Godhead? Is this, is this the Egyptian promise or the Greek promise of the triple crown of Godhead? If you have the right philosophy, you say the right words, the right chants? No. This is the crown of eternal life. To rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years because you showed yourself you want his law in your heart forever. The one who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will never leave it again. Are you physically going to be made a pillar like the ancient Asherah poles of Hathor? Are you literally going to be made a pillar to put him in the temple? No, obviously not. What did the pillars of Hathar and Asherah poles, what did they represent? The wisdom of Babylon. The knowledge, the law of mystery Babylon. Yahweh says at the resurrection, he's going to put his law in your heart so that you obey his precepts and commands. You will be a pillar in his temple. It's a beautiful blessing. Upon him I will write the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem that comes down out of heaven for my God, and my new name. You're going to get the under the authority of your high priest, Yeshua, you're going to get that same name. That means authority. You're going to get into that same authority so you can rule and reign with him for a thousand years at the resurrection because you'll have the perfect righteousness of God, the straight path in your heart that you can teach others. The religious practice, which is the spiritual journey of the labyrinth, is built upon seeking the essence within to know yourself and to connect with the divine unknowable, which also is referred to as the spiritual illumination. So as you can see here, Yahweh has a very different way. The ways of Babylon, which is going to be this, the fundamental application of spirituality from the dragon, the beast, and the second false prophet, second beast, that they deceive the whole world with, and in some severe cases, cause men to want death and not even be able to have it at that time. All of it is the spiritual path to look inside yourself so you can try to connect with the realm of the gods and the goddesses, to be in touch with that, that bridge to the divine unknowable that you can never truly know that you can never truly have communion with, but you, maybe you'll say the right words in the right way. It's hopelessness. 
It's not the promises by our incredible father given to us to know plainly, like he says in Jeremiah 33, two through three, thus says Yahweh who made the earth, Yahweh who formed it and established it. Yahweh is his name. Call to me and I will answer you and show you great and unsearchable things you do not know. Yahweh's not setting up a labyrinth for you. He tells you very plainly, I made everything. Call to me. I'll, I'll tell you great and unsearchable things you just you don't know. I'm not going to dangle that wisdom and knowledge in front of you. Never give it to you. I'm not going to have you chased by demons and the fear, motivated by fear, in order to find this, to look inside yourself. No, he says, call to me. Call to, call to Yahweh. Don't look inside yourself. The heart is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? Why would you want to look inside yourself? You're full of rots and mis, misguidance and bad partial knowledge. No, no. Look to the creator who created all things. Call to him. He'll tell you great and unsearchable things you don't know. He wants to. Are you guys ready to see one of the most amazing things? Um, that I discovered, I thought I thought it was pretty amazing when I was doing research for this episode that I discovered that the connection with the Dejed and the Astral Pole, um, because I hadn't seen that before until I just digged a little deeper, right? But this, this is fantastic. I hope you stayed. We're almost at three hours. I hope you stayed because it's, uh, this is crazy. The proposed depiction of Jer Jericho. The ancient city of Jericho was a, a walled off city. We see that from the scriptures. And this is what, you know, historians and archaeologists would propose that they think it may have looked like within the walls. Here's a, here's a more, you know, and there's a, the way that the, the hill of Jericho where they, they do know where it is today and they can see that it has like multiple layers to the hill of Jericho. And so they, they feel like it had a larger outer wall and then an interior wall, but they're just guessing still because they don't know exactly how it was laid out. This is a Hebrew Bible from the 14th century on the left and from the 15th century on the right. And in it, there were illustrations. And the illustration specifically of Jericho was that it was built as a labyrinth, a circular labyrinth. This is from a, a Fahi Bible from the 14th century. On the right is the Taj Torah from Yemen, another Hebrew Bible, Old Testament. And their illustration of Jericho was that it was built as a labyrinth. Joshua chapter 3, 15 through 17. Now the Jordan overflows its banks throughout the harvest season. But as soon as the priests carrying the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the flowing water stood still. They backed up as far upstream as Adam, a city in the area of Zaratan, while the water flowing toward the Sea of the Arabah, which is the Salt Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. The priests, carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, stood firm on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan, while all Israel crossed over the dry ground until the entire nation had crossed the Jordan. Wonderful story, right? Another moment where it's not the Red Sea, but it's a it's a decent sized river stopped by the Lord crossing over on dry ground. The priests are standing there literally in the middle, looking at the wall of water while all the, you know, potentially two million people crossed over. Amazing. And about a mile or a mile and a half up on the hillside is the city of Jericho looking down, watching this event. Yahweh is saying, Oh, there's something in your path. Should you turn to the right or to the left? Nope, I'll make the way straight. Because that's what Yahweh does. Joshua chapter 4, 20 through 24. On the 10th day of the first month, the people went up from the Jordan and camped at Gilgal. Remember, we talked about that. Or we said, pay attention to that word Gilgal on the eastern border of Jericho. And there at Gilgal, Joshua set up the 12 stones they had taken from the Jordan. And then Joshua said to the Israelites, In the future, when your children ask their fathers, what's the meaning of these stones? You are to tell them, Israel crossed the Jordan on dry, on dry ground. From the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. 
just as he did to the Red Sea, which he dried up before us until we had crossed over. He did this so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, so that you may always fear the Lord your God. Guys, the word Gilgal means circle of stones or circle or wheel. The word Gilgal means circle of stones or circle or wheel. Joshua set up a circle of stones as a memorial. Say, so when your kids ask what this is about, tell them Yahweh stopped the river and let you cross on dry ground at this circle of stones. Not, not so that you can have divine illumination and walk in a circle, find your way out of the, not, not so that you can release, receive, and return. No, so that you can know directly Yahweh provides for us. He even stops the rivers and we can just walk straight through. He makes a way. He makes our path straight. So whenever you see the nations building their little circle of stones, remember Yahweh makes your path straight, even through miraculously walking through something you couldn't normally walk through. And this isn't the first time he does it. Joshua chapter 5, verse 1 through 2. Now when all the Amorite kings west of the Jordan and all the Canaanite kings along the coast heard how the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan before the Israelites until they had crossed over, their hearts melted and their spirits failed for fear of the Israelites. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives and circumcise the sons of Israel once again. The place that they named Gilgal, circle of stones, the circle, the wheel, is where he also asked them to take a circle of flesh and circumcise the sons, which is a sign of the resurrection. Yahweh makes your path straight by giving you commandments that are good for you so that you get to the sign of that circumcision, which is the resurrection. All of this is happening in the sight of people living inside of a labyrinth on the hillside above. Joshua chapter 5, 8 through 11. After all the nation had been circumcised, they stayed there in the camp until they were healed. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Today I've rolled, <laughs> all pun intended, Yahweh is really good with the puns. Today he says, I've rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. So that that place has been called Gilgal to this day. On the evening of the 14th day of the month, while the Israelites were camped at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, they kept the Passover, another sign of the covenant of the resurrection. That the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate unleavened bread and roasted grain from the produce of the land. And this is, of course, when the manna stopped falling because they could eat of the land they were in now. All of this is being witnessed by people living in a labyrinth, governed by false gods with a theological philosophy of a labyrinth. Hosea chapter 9, verse 15. Did you guys know there's more than one Gilgal in Israel's history in the Bible? There was another one just, just northwest of where the sanctuary sat for 400 years in Bethel. Hosea chapter 9, verse 15. All their wickedness is in Galgal. This one's spelled slightly different. It's the same thing. For there I hated them because of the wickedness of their practices. I will cast them out of my house. I will not love them anymore. All their princes are disobedient. This is the northern house prophesied by Hosea before their scattering, before the Assyrians came in, invaded and scattered the northern house. And the northern leaders and priesthood had rebelled from the covenant of Yahweh. They stopped doing the commandments. They're worshiping the Baal and the Asherah and the golden calves. All their wickedness is in Galgal. Here's Galgal Raphaim, northwest of, Beth of Bethel, or the ancient site. The place of the wheel, circle of stones, the wheel. This is where they decide to have their wickedness attributed to. Do we think this is a coincidence? 
What does archaeology show from this site? We'll see in just a minute. Hosea 12, 11 through 14 says, Is there iniquity in Gilead? They will surely come to nothing. Do they sacrifice bulls in Gilgal? Indeed, their altars will be heaps of stones in the furrows of the fields. Ephraim has provoked bitter anger, so his Lord will leave his blood guilt upon him and repay him for his contempt. This is um, Ephraim is judged and scattered by the Assyrians because of their rebellion to Yahweh. And they're sacrificing that Gilgal. What does Gilgal look like? Archaeological remains show Gilgal of Rephaim. You guys notice anything unique? How about a ground penetrating radar scan? that they modeled in a 3D fashion. They lived in a labyrinth. Can't, can't make the stuff up. Hopefully you guys are realizing the Bible is super relevant. Yahweh judges rebellious acts at Gilgal. They lived in a labyrinth. Yahweh judges Jericho, built as a labyrinth. Yahweh strikes, not only makes the way straight in the sight of Jericho, gives the promise of the resurrection through both feast and physical observance at a place called the Circle of Stones, under the nose, under the watch. Of the towers and the walls of Jericho. Joshua 6, 15 through 16 and 20. Then on the seventh day, they got up at dawn and marched around the city seven times in the same manner. That was the only day they circled the city seven times. After the seventh time around, the priests blew the horns, and Joshua commanded the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. So when the ram's horn sounded, the people shouted. When they heard the blast of the horn, the people gave a great shout, and the wall collapsed. Then all the people charged straight into the city and captured it. So, just like the Jordan River, just on the, next to the plains of Jericho, Yahweh said, no, you don't have to turn to the right or the left. I'll make the way straight. Take my authority, take my wisdom, take my ark with my laws, my wisdom, my power, my authority. Stand in the middle of the obstacle. I'll make the way straight for you. We'll stop the water. No problem. Oh, you see that massive city? That's a, a stalwart, a fortified city. Oh, by the way, it's also literally symbolically built um, according to the ways of Babylon, to the philosophy and the law of Babylon. Oh, and by the way, from a military standpoint, attacking a city that's built in the in the form of a labyrinth, very difficult. But what does God do? He has them circle that, that round city. And with the earthquake, with the shout, the horn blast, boom, the walls fall in so they can go straight up into it. They don't have to go in the design of the city to fight their way to the center. They can go straight through the labyrinth. He takes the walls down. This is a third testimony from a different Bible from the 14th century. Oh, excuse me. No, no. This is the Farhi. Just to show you an idea of, of what would have happened to the city of Jericho. This is the Farhi. We already looked at this one. But here are two more, a third and a fourth example from different Bibles, one from the 13th century, the, the late 13th, and then also from the 17th century of a Hebrew scroll. Both, So we have four corroborating different accounts from Hebrew illustrators from the Hebrew Old Testament showing the depiction of Jericho was a circular labyrinth. So this is why we don't we don't put our stock in and in, in searching our, our hearts 
the deceitful thing within us to look for wisdom so we can somehow connect with the divinity within us. That's all that that's it's called new age philosophy now, but it's actually repackaged ancient Egyptian philosophy. And they had a physical test that they would build a labyrinth labyrinths or finger labyrinths, little reminders for you to carry with you, or they would build labyrinths and hedge mazes in front of dignitaries houses or whatnot. Or they would put a massive labyrinth greater than all the Egyptian and Greek uh, temples and works in front of one of their pyramids and put all the Egyptian gods within that labyrinth because it, it embodied literally with all those temples, the whole of Egyptian theology, mystery Babylon theology. So Israel, Yahweh says to Israel, I'm going to take you straight up into Jericho. Yeah, I know that their city's built like a labyrinth. I know that there's a river in front of you. Don't worry about it. I got you. I'm going to take you straight up into to Jericho. And when you get there, I need you to shout. That requires bravery. They've never seen a, a city being broken down like that in one swath. Joshua 7, Joshua 1, 7 through 9. Above all, be strong and very courageous. Be, be careful to observe all the law that my servant Moses gave and commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, so that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law must not depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it, for then you will prosper and succeed in all you do. Have I not commanded you to be strong and courageous? Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord, your Elohim, is with you wherever you go. The philosophy of ancient Babylon, of ancient Greece, of ancient Egypt, caused you to fear, caused you to be discouraged, caused you to search perpetually in a never-ending maze from which you will never find the light of illumination. It's deceptive, vain philosophy. Yahweh says, no, nope, be strong, trust me, do my instructions, my law, my ethics, and I will make your ways straight. Philippians 2, 12 through 13, therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now even more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act on behalf of his good purpose. When I'm doing the laws of God, that's the spirit of God placed in me by the deposit to will and to act according to his good purpose, to follow his commandments. That's his good purpose. That's his will for me. And I do that with respect and trepidation, with fear and trembling. I don't do it because I'm afraid demons are going to come get me and I'll never find the light of mortality. I do it because I, I walk it out with respect to Yahweh and with humility. It's a totally different mindset. And I, and I know exactly what I'm walking out. I'm not having to turn left and right to figure out the maze or the labyrinth. I know his ways are straight. It's an upright highway of righteousness. It's easy. It's a light yoke. It's not a heavy burden. Psalm 143, 8 through 11. Let me hear your faithfulness in the morning, for I trust in you. Teach me the way in which I should walk. For to you I lift up my soul. Save me, Yahweh, from my enemies. I take refuge in you. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. For the sake of your name, Yahweh, revive me. In your righteousness, bring my soul out of trouble. Jeremiah 29, 10-13 For this is what the Lord says, When Babylon's 70 years are complete, I will attend to you and confirm my promise to restore you to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. What does he say? Does he say, you're going to have to figure out what I have for you. I need you to go... Uh, meditate with this contemplative practice, walk through this little circle around and around till you figure out what I have for you. No, we have a good father. He says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a future and a hope. Some translations even say an expected end, to give you a future and an expected end. There's no expected end in the labyrinth. 
in the mystery ways of Babylon and the teachings of confusion, deception. But with Yahweh, he says, look, I'm telling you right now what I want to do for you. It's to give you a future, to prosper you. I don't want to harm you. I want to give you hope. And he tells you what that is. Resurrection unto eternal life, to live with he and his son in their house. It's the promise of the covenant, the promise of the first resurrection, the promise of the kingdom come, the gospel of the kingdom, the good news of God's house coming down to dwell on the earth. Then you will call upon me, you'll come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. There is no end of the labyrinth in Egyptian and, and Babylonian theology. You're in the maze forever. There's no way out. There's no finding illumination. It's a, dece it's a deception. It's a trick. Yahweh says, you will find me if you actually look for me. You will. Psalm 40, verse 5. Many, O Yahweh, my Elohim, are the wonders you have done, and the plans you have for us none can compare to you. If I proclaim and declare them, they are more than I can count. This psalmist knows the plans. He knows the good news of the kingdom to come. Could have been the same one that wrote Psalm 47, talks about the kingdom coming. God tells you what his future wonders are going to be. You may not know every single detail, but he tells you the big picture to go after. He tells you how to get illumined with ultimate wisdom and have his law put on your heart and you live forever with him in his house. He tells you how to get to the end of the story. It's no, it's not a complicated labyrinth. It's simple. It's a straight way. Psalm 33, 8 through 15. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. The Lord frustrates the plans of the nations. He thwarts the devices of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The purposes of his heart to all generations. The counsel of the Lord stands forever and the purposes of his heart to all generations. He's not going to change his mind. He's not going to change the promises that he gave you, the purposes that he's planned for you, the good stuff, the good expected end, the hope of glory, the hope of eternal life with him in his house. He's not going to change his mind. Blessed is the nation whose God is Yahweh, the people he has chosen as his inheritance. Yahweh looks down from heaven. He sees all the sons of men from his dwelling place. He sees, he gazes on all who inhabit the earth. He shapes the hearts of each. He considers all their works. Isaiah 46, 8 through 10. Remember this and be brave. Take it to heart, transgressors. Remember what happened long ago, for I am Yahweh. There is no other. I am Yahweh. I am Elohim. He is the ultimate almighty. There is none like me. I declare the end from the beginning and ancient times from what is still to come. I say my purpose will stand. All my good pleasure I will accomplish. His purposes will stand. He's not going to change his mind. He's told you what to expect. It's not a mystery. He told you who he is. It's not a mystery. He's spirit. He told you where, who his son was. It's not a mystery. He sent him to become a man in the flesh. Glorified him back to his spiritual beings, the promise of the first resurrection. He told you what the end of the story, so you can be hopeful and expect that too. Jeremiah 31, 1 through 6. And at that time declares the Lord, I will be the God of all the families of Israel. They will be my people. This is what the Lord says. So, guys, he's about to tell us. He's about to tell us what he wants for us. The people who survived the sword found favor in the wilderness when Ezra went to find rest. Yahweh appeared to us in the past saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I drawn you with loving devotion. Again, I will build you and you will be rebuilt, O virgin Israel. Again, you will take up your tambourines and you'll go out in joyful dancing. Again, you will plant vineyards on the hills of Samaria. The farmers will plant and enjoy the fruit. For there will be a day when watchmen will call out on the hills of Ephraim, Arise, let us go up to Zion to the Lord our God. Here's a promise of the future. He's telling you, you have your own land, you can plant food, you'll be at peace and rest, and you can come visit me directly. That's the future that he, he announced for everybody. His purposes will stand. And he tells you how to get there. He tells you how the judge is going to evaluate your every word and deed. 
He gives you the standard. It's not a mystery. It's not something you have to search within yourself and find, try to find the connection. If only, if only you said the right words. He doesn't practice negation theology, apophatic theology. Yahweh speaks plainly, the sound words of Christ. Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. What did they say about the labyrinth? Most of it had to be traversed in the dark. But to Yahweh, his word is a lamp to his feet, a light to his path. Psalm 1918, the precepts of the Lord are right, bringing joy to the heart. The commandments of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. This is the illumination that men seek. The secrets of heaven are striving to learn. This is God shining upon you because you practice his commandments, his behavior, his precepts, because they're right. Psalm 43, 3, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy mountain and to the place where you dwell. Very, very straight language. Your light, your truth. It's, this is commandments. Let them lead me. Those commandments were embodied in the, in the uh, example of Messiah. He's the good shepherd. He leads us. He's not leading us on his own volition. He's not leading us through a maze. He's leading us down the straight way because he's the embodiment of light and truth, the commandments of God. And the purpose of the resurrection is he raises us to eternal life and takes us into the holy mountain where Yahweh dwells. It's a beautiful story, guys. It's, it's a story that doesn't require guesswork. It doesn't require... Uh, intimidation. It doesn't require uh, the right passwords, the right way to say things. Because God sees the heart. He sees all the actions of man. He's told you what to do, and he's told you where you'd go if you do it. Very simple. He, doesn't, he tests you on whether you're going to do the straight behavior. He doesn't not give you instruction and throw you into a confusing situation like a labyrinth, and then hope that you can look within yourself to find the answer through your own power and strength to overcome that obstacle and find mystical illumination through mysticism, through the metaphysics, through something that you're searching for, but you can't quite know because it's unknowable. He doesn't expect that of you. He tells you who he is, what he wants to do for you and how to get there. Thanks for watching guys. I appreciate you. Um, hopefully this was a blessing to you. Hopefully this makes a lot of sense. Hopefully you realize now that when we look into why the world is so easily deceived, because these things are being um, reinforced in the culture, which is literally the laws, the philosophies of ancient Babylon, which a lot of people don't realize as we've tried to reveal the character of who the Satan character is from the Hebrew perspective, which he he's actually ancient Ra of ancient Egypt, who had his own system of governance, whom expected things from people and gave them laws to follow by and to, to quote unquote be judged by and and because he of course lies to them he's not really going to be able to judge their hearts in the afterlife Anubis isn't really down is you don't see Anubis when you die you see the angels of God and they take you to to what God says happens not to what the Egyptians say happen Anubis doesn't weigh your heart with a feather against the laws of Mayat that's a lie but that's what he told people because he knew people needed a sense of a sense of direction but his direction is not straight just like a labyrinth there's walls on both sides of you it gives you a sense of direction you got to keep going one way or the other but then you have to get to a place where you turn it's not a straight path and then oh you keep making all these turns and you really never find a straight path because it's all confusion it's semblances of what the creator offers to mankind but it's twisted it makes you turn left and to the right so hopefully guys you see the the, the stark differences and all this is going to matter as we step in further and further into unveiling um, the series of the 42 and all the, the foundational items that, that we need to understand why we see certain things happening. 
So we're going to talk about the two witnesses. We're going to talk about the remnants of believers during the time of the, of the 42 months leading up to the return of Yeshua, because you got the ways of Yahweh versus the laws of my the ways of the, the dragon, the beast and the false prophet. So hopefully this has been a blessing to you guys. If you like this, hit the thumbs up, um, share it, drop, drop me a comment. Tell me how you felt about this presentation. If you stayed till the end, you guys are a trooper. Thank you so much, guys, and uh, we will see you next time.